and p.m. Eastern. Now on C-SPAN 2, a look at rebuilding Iraq. It's a House hearing with many of the people involved in the coalition provisional authority. Also, members of Congress who've returned from Iraq will talk about their trip. He passed away May 31st of 2002. H.R. 3166, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 57 Old Tappan Road in Tappan, New York, as the John G. Dow Post Office Building. Uh, former New York Congressman John Dow passed away in March of this year at the age of, 19, uh, at the age of 97. H.R. 3175, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 2650 Cleveland Avenue Northwest in Canton, Ohio, as the Richard D. Watkins Post Office Building. Richard Watkins will retire next month after serving 12 years as mayor of Canton, Ohio. H.R. 3185, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 38 Spring Street in Nashua, New Hampshire as the Hugh Gregg Post Office Building, a giant in New Hampshire politics for six decades and the father of New Hampshire Senator Judd Gregg. Governor Hugh Gregg passed away on September 24th at the age of 85. And finally, S. 1591, an act to redesignate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 48 South Broadway, Nyack, New York, as the Edward O'Grady, Waverly Brown, Peter Page Post Office Building. Peter Page, a Brinks Incorporated security guard, and Nyack City Patrolman Waverly Brown and Edward O'Grady were shot and killed during a robbery on October 20, 1981. I would now like to recognize my very distinguished ranking member, uh, Mr. Waxman, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We have before us a number of very worthwhile bills, and I would urge all of our colleagues to support them. They will appropriately go on the suspension calendar because these are the bills that uh, are going to receive overwhelming, if not unanimous, support by our colleagues in naming uh, post offices after very worthy individuals who deserve the uh, acknowledgement uh, of their contributions. I uh, urge support for the legislation to yield back my time. Thank you. Given time constraints, I ask members to submit their written statements for the record. I will hold the record open until the end of the day in order to accommodate those members who may not have prepared written statements. I ask unanimous consent the Committee on Government Reform report H.R. 2754, H.R. 3166, H.R. 3175, H.R. 3185, and S. 1591 to, to the House with the rec recommendation that these bills do pass. Any member wish to speak on the unanimous consent request? Hearing and seeing none without objection, the unanimous consent request is agreed to. The business meeting is now adjourned, and we will reconvene in two minutes to begin our hearing. Thank you.
Push that so you have the lights on. Just after they finish speaking, go ahead and turn it off. Just take a seat. Good morning. A, a quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I want to welcome everybody to today's hearing on the U.S.-led coalition efforts to restore peace, freedom, security, and dignity to the people of Iraq. <clears throat> on August 24th, I led an 11-member bipartisan delegation to see firsthand our efforts in Iraq. Uh, before leaving the U.S., I had no real idea of what to expect on my visit. After all, most press accounts of our efforts in Iraq were full of gloom and doom. But what we witnessed was an Iraq of great promise, vibrancy, and, vit and vitality. We saw a nation with potential and a people that were enjoying the fruits of freedom in its infancy. We saw a remarkable progress throughout the country, whether it was a hospital in Baghdad or a new police station in Mosul. We witnessed a busy market in Mosul where one could buy anything under the sun, including items that were forbidden under Saddam Hussein's regime, such as satellite dishes, one of the hottest uh, selling items in the country. We met with newly elected regional council members, men and women, Kurds, Shias, Sunnis, Sunnis, who spoke of embracing democratic values and representing all of Iraq, not just their own religions, tribes, and hometowns. We also witnessed the greatness of our military, not of their might, but of their humble actions in assisting a people in need. Our soldiers are firm in their resolve to stay until the job is finished. These young men and women are not only soldiers, but also peacekeepers. And when we called upon diplomats and friends, we, there's no doubt we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Our military is still in harm's way. But from what I have seen, we can be successful as long as we remain steadfast, patient, and committed. The coalition's work is far from over. Iraq is still a work in progress, and new challenges arise every day. We must overcome the many security threats that to this day continue to be the greatest challenge to our troops and the stabilization of Iraq. Rebuilding efforts, although well underway and perhaps well ahead of schedule, will not succeed in the end if we cannot overcome the prevailing threats against those um, who are there to help. While I'm confident that we will succeed in ridding Iraq of elements that we want to, that want to see the coalition fail, we need to keep in mind several important lessons, such as, while the rotation of military forces in Iraq is essential, increasing the number of military personnel in the area may not be necessary or advisable to accomplish the mission. Second, reconstituting a qualified and effective Iraqi military police force and border protection guard is a key element to improving overall security in Iraq. The development of functioning institutions in a secure environment is essential to Iraq's success. Furthermore, the sooner Iraqis can take responsibility for their own affairs, the sooner U.S. forces can come home. For human intelligence to improve, we need the participation of Iraqi Americans who have the skills the knowledge and the willingness to assist in intelligence gathering and analysis. However, we need to actively recruit, vet, and train these individuals. In order for these people to be effective, we need to expedite the security clearance process. Iraqi citizens can provide vital intelligence about the whereabouts of weapons of mass destruction, but the coalition forces need the authorization to grant relocation and protective status to informants and their extended families. Saddam Hussein misappropriated much of the money loaned to Iraq for his own personal benefit to the detriment of the Iraqi people. My colleague, Congresswoman Carol Maloney, has introduced H.R. 2482, which could greatly benefit the people of Iraq by canceling odious debt in accordance with customary international law. This is potentially a very wealthy country. 
second largest oil reserves in the world, the fertile crescent there between the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, River, the Garden of Eden, ancient Mesopotamia, but with a debt structure that is four times our gross domestic product. No nation can survive under that structure. So that is obviously going to have to be revisited if this country is succeeding. While operations in Iraq are still young, we are only 160 days into the rebuilding effort. We have accomplished much. We are building schools, upgrading hospitals, and modernizing the utilities infrastructure at a pace that surpasses operations we led after World War II. And we are well ahead of the pace of our reconstruction efforts in the Balkans. Still, most of the media accounts of post-war Iraq discuss rampant chaos and mismanagement. However, according to a public opinion poll conducted in August by the Zogli Group, more than two-thirds of those Iraqis who expressed an opinion wanted coalition troops to remain in Iraq for at least another year, and 70 percent of Iraqis said they expect their country and their uh, personal lives to be better in five years. During our visit to Iraq, the delegation visited a site southwest of Baghdad in a sector guarded by the U.S. Marines known as al Hilla. One could not begin to describe this site. There are no landmarks to identify its location, but we know of this place because once we overthrew Saddam, the Iraqi people themselves were our guides. In those early days after we swept through this area, Iraqis by the dozens came to al Hilla to do something that is hard to put into words. They dug. Yes, many came to this nondescript place to dig, many with their bare hands. They dug because it is here that we learned of Saddam's brutality. al Hilla was a killing field. For reasons unknown except to Saddam and his henchmen, men, women, and children were summarily executed over a span of many days. They were buried, and the process was repeated time and time again. People buried on top of one another. This was a scheme designed by a sociopath bent on crippling the Iraqi people. Now the people return, most with kitchen utensils in their hands, to find and dig up remains of loved ones. Under the protection of coalition forces, Iraqis are learning what it means to be free. Our role in Iraq has just begun, and it is a new fight, a fight that is far greater than simply ridding Iraq of Saddam Hussein. We need time, patience, and most of all the resolve to finish the job we started. The people of Iraq deserve no less. Our men and women serving in Iraq want to finish the job, and we need to support them while the Iraqi people savor freedom and bring stability to a region that desperately needs it. Through this hearing, the Committee hopes to gain insight from the on-the-ground experience of the people performing reconstruction projects in Iraq, as well as the viewpoints of Iraqi Americans, scholars, and others who have recently observed the reconstruction process. I also welcome my colleagues, many of whom are not members of this committee but have traveled to Iraq and have their own views, emotions, and experiences that they want to share. With that in mind, we have assembled an impressive group of witnesses to help us assess our efforts and our progress in Iraq. We will hear from the Department of Defense and the Coalition Provisional Authority. We will also receive input from some distinguished Iraqi Americans, as well as a constitutional scholar who will provide us her thoughts regarding the inclusion of women's rights in the, in the as yet to be determined Constitution. I want to thank all our witnesses appearing before the committee. I look forward to their testimony. I also want to acknowledge and welcome the many non-committee members attending today's hearing. Due to time constraints, we intend to limit opening statements. The ranking member and myself, members will have five legislative days to submit opening statements for the record. All members will have ample opportunity to give their views and question today's witnesses. Uh, I do intend to recognize committee members first, followed by the other members in order of their appearance. And Mr. Waxman and I are going to have to leave in the middle of the hearing and come back because we have bills that will be pending uh, on the floor, but it shouldn't take much time. And I will yield at that point to another committee member to preside. I would now yield to my ranking member, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am very pleased that you have called this hearing on the important subject of restoration efforts in Iraq, and I want to commend you for traveling there to seek firsthand information. All of us here share deep appreciation for the efforts of our military and our civilian employees in Iraq to promote stability in Iraq and improve the well-being of its citizens. Congressional oversight is essential to help ensure that Reconstruction is proceeding in a manner that gets results and makes efficient use of American taxpayers' dollars. My own oversight efforts began in March when I wrote the administration about the multi-billion dollar contract it entered into with Halliburton on a sole source basis. Since then, I have written many other letters seeking basic information about how taxpayer funds are being spent in Iraq. 
This August, I sent senior staff to Iraq to gather additional information as part of the Chairman's delegation. Overall, this has been a frustrating process. Transparency is the only way to dispel public concern about the lucrative contracts that the administration has en entered into with Halliburton, Bechtel, and other large campaign contributors operating in Iraq. Yet, with the exception of the Corps of Engineers, the administration has provided virtually no meaningful information to Congress or the public about how it has spent taxpayers' dollars in Iraq. For example, in April, I asked the administrator of AID for basic information about the contracting process with respect to contracts worth over a billion dollars that were limited to only a few hand-picked companies. AID has still not provided copies of the contracts or information on source selection. Despite a recommendation by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to allow public scrutiny of a no-bid sole source oil field contract with Halliburton subsidiary Kellogg, Brown & Root, the Defense Department continues to classify the details of the contract as a national security secret. The administration still has not responded to my letter on September 12th requesting that it explain why the President's request for an additional $2.1 billion to repair Iraq's oil infrastructure is over 2.5 times larger than a detailed estimate prepared just a few months ago by the CPA, the Corps of Engineers, and the Iraqi Ministry of Oil. This secrecy is simply unacceptable. Two companies alone, Halliburton and Bechtel, have been given contracts worth over $3 billion relating to the conflict and reconstruction in Iraq. Members of con Congress and taxpayers who are footing this enormous, bills, this enormous bill should know how this money is being spent. While the administration has declined to respond to basic requests about its contracts, information I have received from a variety of sources is painting a disturbing picture. It appears that big American contractors are receiving too much money for too little work and too few opportunities are being afforded Iraqis. Members of the Iraqi Governing Council, for example, have told my staff that costs to the American taxpayers could be reduced by 90 percent if the projects were awarded to Iraqi contractors rather than to large American companies. Anecdotal information from innovative field commanders in Iraq confirms this account. During the chairman's congressional delegation, the members and staff met with Major General David Petraeus, the general in charge of northern Iraq. General Petraeus said that the U.S. engineers estimated that it would cost $15 million to bring a cement plant in northern Iraq to Western production standards. But because this estimate was substantially higher than funds available, Gen General Petraeus gave the project to local Iraqis who got the cement plant running for just $80,000. Think about this. General Petraeus reduced the cost to U.S. taxpayers by 99 percent by using local Iraqi contractors instead of Halliburton or Bechtel. Many people don't realize this, but the billion-dollar contracts with Bechtel and Halliburton are what is known as cost-plus contracts. These contracts are structured so that the bigger, the more complex, and the more expensive the project, the greater profits for these companies. This is obviously a good deal for the companies, but is it a good deal for the taxpayer? The administration's supplemental request for an additional $20 billion for reconstruction raises many questions. It includes numerous proposals for complex, state-of-the-art Western facilities that almost certainly will have to be performed by large government contractors under abuse-prone con plus, con, cost plus contracts. Of the 115 discrete projects described by the CPA in the supplemental, fewer than 25 mention employment opportunities for Iraqis. 
I hope that the Army and CPA witnesses here today will be able to shed light on some of the questions about reconstruction contracts that remain unanswered to date. And I encourage the majority on this committee and in the rest of the Congress to move forward with the minority in conducting meaningful oversight of the restoration process in Iraq. Mr. Chairman, I hope this hearing will be a, a beginning of that uh, opportunity for oversight. I thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Uh, thank you. I just want to just say on the cement plant, I remember talking to the uh, General Petrus about that, and he awarded the contract to an Iraqi firm, but he never said it would be up to Western standards. Uh, but he did what he could with the money, and I know firsthand that, and uh, our witnesses can talk about this, that we are trying to give Iraqis as much of that work as we can, because rebuilding the economy, their economy is a major part of what is uh, happening. But our witnesses can address that, and we will have ample time to do uh, questions and answers. And why don't we move to our panel? It is the policy of this. Uh, members' written statements will be in here, and all of you will have ample time under questions and answers to make statements, and we will relax it. So uh, if you would all rise with me and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give uh, to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Um, we have the Honorable Les Brownlee, the Acting Secretary of the Army, former staffer with Senator Warner, and we are happy to have you here. Philo Dibble, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Near East Affairs. Uh, we have Tom Korologos, a Senior Advisor to Ambassador uh, Paul Bremer. Uh, U.S. Ma Major General Carl Strzok, who is the Director of Operations and Infrastructure of the Coalition Provisional Authority, and Mr. Bernie Carrick. Is the former director of the uh, uh, Interior Coalition Provisional Authority and former police chief in New York. Um, why don't we start, uh, Secretary Brownlee, with you and we'll move right down. I think you know the rules. Uh, your entire statements are in the record. Our members have a lot of questions and comments they're going to want to make, and, and I won't start with questions. I'll start uh, moving down the way. So, welcome. And as the, when the light turns orange, uh, that means four minutes are up, and when it's red, five minutes. And, and we can move quickly. We want to give you an opportunity to say what you need to say, but your entire statement is in the record. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on the tremendous accomplishments of our soldiers, both active and reserve components, and the great progress they are making in winning the peace in Iraq. I know that many of you have just recently returned from Iraq, and on behalf of the soldiers who are serving our country, let me begin by expressing gratitude for the exceptional support you have provided to them and their families as well. I am happy to join you here this morning to talk about the marvelous work our soldiers are doing and the great progress that is being made every day in Iraq. I visited Iraq in June and again in late September, and I am pleased to share with you what I learned. The insurgency being waged in Iraq includes foreign fighters and terrorist groups, along with former Ba'athists, making this the central battlefront of the war on terrorism. After a lightning ground attack into Baghdad and overwhelming military victory by coalition forces, the mission in Iraq now remains clear to win the peace. Our soldiers understand this mission, and their commitment to getting the job done is having an extraordinarily positive effect on the people of Iraq. Soldiers are working with the Iraqi people, our coalition partners, and the international community to achieve a better Iraq for the Iraqis, the region, and the world. During my visits to Iraq, I have witnessed the progress being made, and I can tell you that things are getting better and will continue to get better, both for the people of Iraq and for our men and women serving there. Here are a few of the great things that are happening. Local government councils exist in over 90 percent of the country and are taking increasing responsibility for civic administration and services. Our Army divisions are training Iraqi police, facility protection forces, and civil defense corps to assume responsibility for local security and law enforcement. Our units are helping get Iraqi schools running again. In the Baghdad region alone, we will have 820 schools refurbished by the end of October. We are continuing to make things safer for the people of Iraq and our own troops by removing ammunition caches from around the country. The nation's infrastructure was badly neglected under the Ba'ath regime, and we are helping to restore and modernize it. For example, we are hiring Iraqis to help restore the oil industry and power generation and to repair roads. These are put a few of the thousands of things our Army is busy doing for the people of Iraq and for our own troops. Last month, soldiers began taking advantage of the R&R leave program, which allows them to spend two weeks away from the theater during their 12-month tour. 
Since my last visit to Iraq in June, we have opened 31 new dining facilities for our troops, as well as Internet cafes, chapels and exchanges. Most soldiers are living in hard structures or climate controlled billets, so troops returning from patrols can adequately rest and refit. In Iraq, the mission for our soldiers continues. They must attack and eliminate remaining anti-coalition forces and assist interim governments in to deliver basic services to their people. Our soldiers must simultaneously conduct combat operations and provide humanitarian assistance, often shifting between these two in the same day. The administration is aware of our concerns and requirements. President Bush has asked Congress for the resources to help fight the war on terror, and they are addressed in the FY04 supplemental. We urge Congress to assist us by quickly passing this legislation. Despite remarkable successes, our fight is not over. Our enemies are committed and believe we lack the resolve to win the peace in Iraq. <clears throat> I can assure you this is not true. Our commanders and troops are determined and optimistic and feel that we are gaining momentum in the fight. In years to come, when historians write the story of this critical period, they will note that in Iraq and around the globe, the unwavering commitment, courage and compassion of the American soldier led the way in the fight against terror. By carrying the fight to the enemy, the Army is destroying terrorism today in its home nests and spawning grounds, providing protection to the American people and striking fear in the hearts of our enemies. In closing, I would like to take this opportunity to thank this committee for the opportunity to appear here today and for your continued support for the men and women in uniform deployed in Iraq, Afghanistan and around the world fighting terrorism. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank all our soldiers for their service and their families as well for the sacrifices they are all making for our nation. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Secretary Brownlee. Uh, Secretary Dibble, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am grateful for the opportunity to appear before the committee this morning, and I will keep my remarks brief. Several senior administration officials, including Ambassador Bremer of the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad and Deputy Secretary of State Armitage, have testified in recent days on key issues concerning U.S. policy on Iraq. Their statements stand alone as the Administration's position on Iraq, but I am here to attempt to address any questions you may have. It is in the interest of all Americans and, indeed, the international community to see peaceful and prosperous countries across this important region. For far too long, Iraq exported destabilizing waves of violence and terrorism across its borders and around the world. Iraq now has the potential to turn the situation around and become a source of stability and prosperity in the region, around the world, and for Americans here at home. Meeting our military objectives in Iraq was only the beginning of reaching that vision, however, not the end. While it is in our interest to stabilize the situation, we also owe it to our men and women in uniform, to their courage and sacrifice, to accomplish the entire mission. In addition, we need to support our own people who also serve on the front lines of this fight, providing assistance in what are often dangerous circumstances and insecure settings. I would like to continue by paying tribute to my friends and colleagues throughout Iraq on both military and civilian sides. They are working extraordinarily hard at heavy personal risk to restore stability and security, reestablish normal life for Iraqis, and help lay the basis for Iraqis to succeed in the election of a representative government. They deserve all our thanks. Mr. Chairman, succeeding in this project in all its aspects is a vital interest of the United States. We cannot fail. The task has three main dimensions, security, restoring normal life for Iraqis and establishing a political process. Each dimension is related to the others and is a necessary condition for success. Security is a fundamental requirement for normal life and for a legitimate political process. Restoration of normal life, meaning access to employment, to health care, to education and clean water, among so many other things, is desirable in itself and underpins security. Finally, a political process provides confidence to the Iraqi people that they will soon take on the task of governing themselves. That confidence, in turn, contributes to security. These are difficult times as the situation in Iraq continues to shift and take shape. With the clarity of hindsight, however, I believe we will know this nation had the courage to take tough decisions to safeguard our future peace and prosperity at the time when it mattered most. In so doing, the U.S. government has the opportunity to help not only our own people, but also the people of Iraq, the region, and around the world. 
Success in Iraq, however, is also a vital interest of the international community. As such, we have sought and achieved international participation in the coalition. We look to the United Nations to contribute its substantial expertise and experience in this connection, and we are aggressively seeking substantial financial support from the international community for the reconstruction effort. This outlines the main elements of our policy in, on Iraq, and I would be happy to respond to the Committee's questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Tom Korolokas, thanks for being with us. Chairman. Get the microphone on here. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the Committee, my name is Tom Korologos. I am a senior counselor to Ambassador L. Paul Bremer, the Coalition Provisional Authority Special Envoy in Iraq. My responsibilities include working with three other senior counselors, the various coalition ministers and staff, and also handling visiting congressional delegations as they come through Iraq, and your group uh, was among them, and I see other members here on the committee who were there. When I first got to Baghdad last May, it was a city burning. We were given earplugs to shut out gunfire and so we could sleep. Today, we are living in the midst of a rebirth for this malign country that has enjoyed more religious and political freedom in the past four months than in the past 40 years. I have traveled the country extensively with Ambassador Bember and with the members of Congress, and I've seen firsthand the successes that have followed the ceasing of these hostilities. As many of you who visited us this summer know full well, Baghdad is not a war-ravaged city. Baghdad is a hustling and bustling city where you can buy everything on the streets from air conditioners to refrigerators to satellite dishes to shoes. To be sure, all of us dread hearing about the shootings or attacks on American soldiers in Iraq. And as Ambassador Bremer said two weeks ago, our day begins eight hours ahead of yours here, and we learn about those attacks before we, you awaken. We deplore those losses and wish they weren't so. Mr. Chairman, as you have heard us say time and again, we have three goals in Iraq, and as my colleagues on the panel have stated, our plan from the start has been to restore security, restore the economy, and restore the governance. We are making progress on all three fronts. And those of you from the committee who joined us know this firsthand. What we have in Iraq is a rich country, which, as the chairman said, is temporarily poor. It has oil, it has water, it has an energetic, smart population. It's not unlike California, as a matter of fact, including problems with the economy and the government. Let me, let me list a few facts. Schools reopened last week, as Secretary Brownlee said, and we're luring children back where attendance had plummeted 50 percent of the eligible attendees. We're prepared and distributing five million new math and science textbook, textbooks minus Saddam's ideology. When I first arrived there, we had nine-mile-long gasoline lines. Today, we have traffic jams. We love traffic jams. <laughs> they mean the, people are the gas is flowing and people are out working, and General Strzok will give you the details of the oil business. The central bank is now open, providing loans and conducting commerce. In two weeks, we're distributing a new currency to the Iraqis. Foreign investment is poised to come to Iraq. One member of the Governing Council told me two months ago when Ambassador Bremer first approached the issue that if anybody had said the words foreign investment under the old regime, he'd have had his throat cut. Independent voices are being heard for the first time in 40 years. We have almost 200 newspapers up and running, 27 TV stations, 26 radio stations functioning. The coalition, as uh, Secretary Brownlee and General Strzok in a minute will tell you, has completed more than 8,000 projects around the country, re uh, refurbishing everything from soccer fields to health clinics to roads and bridges throughout the country. Saddam budgeted $13 million for health care in 2002. We have allocated $210 million, a 3,200 percent increase. On April 9th, there were only 30 percent of the hospitals running. Today, all 240 around the country are open. Four million Iraqi children have received 22 million doses of vaccine. Pre-war, the country was averaging 4,000 megawatts of power. The demand was 6,000. We're now around 3,900, closing in on that issue. Oil is pumping. We're about a million seven million barrels a day and hope to get back to pre-war levels around three million. The Governing Council is up and running. They have just named 25 various ministers to run the government, and those ministers probably constitute the most educated cabinet group 
in the world, since most of them have PhDs. And as Secretary Brownlee also said, there are more than 700 democratically selected district council members. They include Sunnis, Shiites, Christians, Arabs, and Kurds, with more than 75 women among them. Ninety percent of the Iraqi people now live under local representative governing councils. Ninety percent of the courts are up and running. And last week I saw they even created the Iraqi Bar Association. On and on the list runs, Mr. Chairman, and those of you who have been there uh, can see those lists as we present them to you. The lament for those of us and during 50 and 60 straight days of 100 degree heat, we had a 137 degree day once this summer, of where we wear flak jackets when we leave the compound, we run around in armored cars when we go downtown, and in talking with about 95 to 98 percent of the Iraqis who support us, all I meant comes from the fact there are good things happening and very few Americans know anything about them. The reporting of those accomplishments, unfortunately, take a back seat to the police blotter type journalism that fills the front pages of the American papers. And as the chairman said, those of you who went to the Ahila gravesite with me on our trip, I repeat what I said then. I find the silence on the mass graves deafening. Total 1.3 million Iraqis are missing from wars and mass murders. Human rights groups estimate that 300 of those are in mass graves. One mass grave alone holds the bodies of 1,200 children. There are some 35 or 40 mass grave sites all around Iraq filled with Iraqis who oppose Saddam. If there's any doubt about our going in there in the first place, come see me. I'll take you down to Al-Hila for a poignant awakening. Yes, there are bumps in the road. And yes, Ambassador Bremer has made audibles uh, throughout the process. We're going to need many, many dollars to bring this country back to some semblance of freedom. And once that happens, the entire Middle East hopefully will stand up and take notice and some sanity will come to that part of the world. Let me close with a couple of points. Everybody wants to know when the troops are coming home. The troops will start coming home when Ambassador Bremer comes home and the CPA succeeds. And when will that be? Let me cite a RAND study, a RAND Corporation study, which took a look at post-war rebuilding efforts in Germany, Japan, uh, and Kosovo and Bosnia. The study said of Iraq, staying there does not assume success. Leaving early guarantees failure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was feeling pretty confident until you told me the warriors were getting organized over there. So, <laughs> General Strzok, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as a soldier and a citizen, I'd like to start by thanking this committee. So I'm uh, Major General Carl Strzok. I'm the Director of Civil Works for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. As a soldier and a citizen, I'd like, I would like to start, as the other members did, by thanking this committee and the Congress for your continued and unwavering support to our military as we pursue the global war on terrorism. Sir, I've recently returned from Iraq after six months where I served with the uh, Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance and then the Coalition Provisional Authority. I held several positions culminating as Deputy Director of Operations and Infrastructure for Ambassador Bremer. I was also the Senior Corps of Engineer Officer in Iraq and had responsibility to ensure that my agency was adequately and appropriately represented in, the, in supporting the effort. We did that in many ways. Uh, we have responsibility for the restoration of Iraqi oil infrastructure. We're supporting the U.S. Agency for International Development and the administration of their large construction contract. We're providing forward engineer support teams to each of the regional coordinators to assess, plan, prioritize, and execute projects in their areas. We provided ministry advisory teams to eight of the ministries of the Iraqi government. We're supporting the creation of a new Iraqi army with facilities. We've recently sent a task force in to assist in the uh, restoration of, of, of electrical power. In all, 39 of our 40 districts are represented with about 400 people, mostly civilians, all volunteers, who are out there on the front line on a daily basis risking their lives in support of the Iraqi people in our country. So we're working in partnership with many, many agencies and international organizations, the USAID, other departments from our government, state, transportation, health and human services, agriculture, commerce. We're working with international organizations, UNICEF, UNESCO, UNDP, non-governmental organizations, the International Committee for Red Cross, Red Crescent, CARE, and others. We're also working with the coalition military forces who have been a tremendous augmentation to the CPA capability to to reconstruct infrastructure, has, as has been mentioned by the committee. Sir, most importantly, though, I think uh, it's important to note that it's the Iraqi people themselves who are really doing the heavy lifting in this. The ministries, uh, the private sector there, have prov proven to be competent, committed, and uh, courageous 
in their support of this, uh, of this effort. We simply could not do what we've done if the Iraqis had not been involved from the very beginning. We came into a situation which is desperate. The infrastructure of this country has suffered a 30-year insult. Many reasons for that. First of all, and fundamentally, is the neglect of the system, in some cases benign neglect, in some cases very deliberate neglect on the part of Saddam's regime. Services under Saddam Hussein were used as reward and punishment. Uh, you can see a dramatic difference in the quality of life in Baghdad, where tip citizens typically enjoy 22 to 24 hours of power a day, and al Qut, where they would only get two hours of power a day. So the infrastructure was, was built around those who supported him and was denied to those who did not. We also suffered war damage because we had made very careful efforts to limit damage through what we call effects-based targeting, where you decide what effect you want to create and do it with minimum impact to the infrastructure. We were able to keep actual war damage to a minimum, very insignificant aspect of the problems we're facing now. We suffered tremendous looting after the uh, fall of the regime. Much of this was individual looting of people out for personal gain, and much of it then turned to a criminal element of deliberate and structured dismantling of the infrastructure. There's also been, and I think the, the largest factor has been deliberate sabotage by the former regime loyalists who are doing everything they can to thwart our efforts and make it difficult for us to restore some level of normalcy to this country. The result of all these things has been almost the total devastation of this country. Not only the physical infrastructure, but the human infrastructure. Those people who are committed to maintaining the infrastructure have suffered dramatically in how they were able to do their jobs and how they're, and they are continuing to suffer intimidation and coercion as they support the effort. The other panel members have already discussed some of the results, so I won't go into the details of those. Uh, one of the most important, though, that I would mention is the uh, electrical power restoration, which now exceeds 4,500 megawatts, which is more than enough to provide for the daily needs of the Iraqi people. Oil production has now reached the 2 million barrel per day uh, level, and we're simply now in the process of developing the export facilities. There's much work to be done. A good foundation has been laid, and I might add largely with Iraqi resources, supplemented by our tax taxpayers' dollars. But resistance continues those within Iraq and outside of Iraq that have an interest in this outcome are working very hard to counter our efforts. We're fighting for the will of the Iraqi people, and to a degree, we're fighting for the will of the American people. Our soldiers won this war because they had the will to fight for what they believed in. And I think the Iraqi soldiers lost because they did not have the will to fight for a corrupt regime. I firmly believe that they melted away because they knew that was in the best interest of their country. We must not disappoint those Iraqi soldiers, and we must not uh, neglect the sacrifices of our soldiers. We've got to continue this effort. There's no option but to see it through. As you mentioned, sir, Iraq is an impoverished company, a country with tremendous potential, vast natural wealth, and tremendous human capital. All they need from us right now is continued support and substantial assistance in accelerating their return to normalcy. I am intensely proud that I had the opportunity to serve this nation and the, and the people of Iraq, and I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee today. Thank um, you, sir. Thank you, General. Um, Bernie Carrick, thanks for being with us, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to echo uh, the General's comments in thanking the committee here and other members of Congress for coming to Iraq and seeing for yourself, seeing firsthand uh, what has happened there, uh, what it was like before, what, is, what it is like today, and, and the great successes we've had in the CPA. I'm Bernard Carrick. For four months, I oversaw the Ministry of Interior as the senior policy advisor to Ambassador Bremer for the Interior. The Interior uh, houses the police, customs, borders, immigration, uh, emergency man management, and fire services for the entire country. The Iraqi police services, as they stand today, are unable to independently maintain law and order and need the assistance and guidance of the coalition forces to accomplish this task. They have suffered years of neglect coupled by a repressive command structure that prohibited training, proactive initiative, and stifled attempts toward modernization of the police. Unless redesigned and redeveloped, the Iraqi police will not constitute a suitable, viable, supportable, or sustainable police service for a free Iraq. Although the police force in Iraq was, the, was only a part of the security apparatus used by Saddam's repressive regime, 
They are the only institution which remains somewhat intact following the conflict. In the opinion of many citizens, the police are inexplicably linked with a cruel and repressive regime that has been substantially tainted by their association. Generally seen as a part of the regime's enforces, the populace normally describes the police as corrupt, unprofessional, and untrustworthy. The police force was a quasi-military institution heavily steeped in military tactics, doctrine, discipline, and philosophy, concurrently staffed with active military personnel who were tightly controlled by Baghdad and Saddam. Because of this restrictive control, the police services languished for the last 35 years and now displays the results of poor standards, inadequate expectations of performance, absence of understanding and appreciation for human rights, poor management, and insufficient and inadequate training. Following the conflict, most of the police infrastructure was badly damaged, stolen, or destroyed during the cathartic looting, which succeeded the end of hostilities. As the public order situation has improved, many of the police who fled coalition forces have returned to work, not only within Baghdad, but across the country, now nearly 40,000 in strength. Their ability to operate effectively in general was hampered by their inadequate knowledge of basic police skills, such as patrol techniques, interviewing, and crime scene investigation, and hampered by a lack of equipment, and was hampered by a lack of equipment. As a result of the training, oversight, and assistance by the coalition and their willingness to cooperate with the coalition, they have demonstrated enormous progress in securing and stabilizing Iraq in the last several months. Establishing a sufficient, proactive, deterrent police presence remains one of the principal priorities of the coalition provisional authority, and the Iraq Police Service is presently engaged in extensive administrative and operational reforms. The thorough vetting of existing personnel was and is required, along with extensive retraining of those who survived this attrition process. The recruitment and screening of new Iraqi police has begun, and the training of new recruits, untainted by its vestiges of the former regime, must be accomplished as soon as possible. This infusion of new ideas, ideals, and expectations will invigorate the police service while forcing existing personnel to challenge paradigms of behavior that have held them hostage throughout their careers. Complementing these ideas is the installation of a proactive and aggressive Office of Professional Standards that will hold officers accountable to a standardized set of intentionally accepted policies, rules, and regulations that will guide the police service long after international advising and police assistance have ended. The reform of the police is a long-term program that will require considerable international assistance through financial in-kind contributions and qualified police personnel to train, monitor, and advise their Iraqi counterparts. As there are too many accomplishments to mention in the interior in this statement, I welcome the opportunity to go over them with you and other members of the committee at your request. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. To be here. Thank you very much. And I've made an opening statement. And just, Tom, let me just ask you one question. I get a lot of questions from my constituents when I go out and they say, well, I'm, you know, even if everything goes well in Iraq, even if we rebuild this country, it's taking tremendous resources from America, minimum of $87 billion, probably well in excess of that, American lives, American dollars to rebuild Iraq. Uh, ultimately, is this a good use of our resources or could they have been better used uh, to rebuild our own infrastructure and our own cities and help our own people? Mr. Chairman, uh, is this one? Mr. Chairman, uh, the $87 billion includes $20.3 billion, which is for the coalition. The other piece of it is for the military side. Uh, the short answer is yes, it is uh, in the national interest of the United States to go in there and provide stability, create a country in the heart of the Middle East, which has been in turmoil for 2,000 years, a democratic uh, state, uh, where even today you have uh, the Iranians all nervous over what's going on in Iraq. Uh, it, my view is that it will stabilize that whole part of the world. In addition, uh, the example that we can use historically is the Marshall Plan. Ambassador Bremer keeps mentioning that in his testimony as an example of American uh, interest and American support for a war-torn Europe that has brought us today the Europe we know. Uh, right after the war, 
uh, World War II. Uh, it was a shambles, and the uh, American uh, generosity went in and created uh, the stability that we have had in Europe ever since. Uh, World War I ended, and it was the war to end all wars, but it wasn't long before uh, we, we had the creation of a Hitler and we had a creation of a Mussolini, which created uh, even more uh, uh, problems for uh, uh, the world in, in World War II. So, so yes, it is worth it. Uh, and to uh, wipe out a regime like Saddam Hussein uh, shows other regimes around uh, that, ho holy cow, uh, these Americans mean business. We better uh, perhaps shape up. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me uh, recognize Mr. Colby. Thank one you, of Mr. the Chairman. cardinals, one of the key appropriators on this area, and somebody who's taken a leadership role. Thank you, Mr. Role. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding this hearing and uh, for the opportunity to, to, to be here. I, I really applaud you for doing this. Uh, it is, as we've heard from the witnesses already in their opening statements, a very important uh, issue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you suggested, because I do chair the Foreign Operations Subcommittee, I am keenly involved, uh, deeply involved in the reconstruction in Iraq. In fact, uh, I was first there in Kuwait in April, just sh shortly after the fall of Baghdad, with our USAID director of uh, disaster response, or DART team, and our mission director, Lou Luck, as they prepared to deploy to um, Iraq. Uh, at that time, I had the opportunity to see my good friend Chris Shea, a member of this uh, committee, who was there at that time and made the first uh, entry into, into Iraq. Uh, initially last winter, going back even before that, as part of the U.S. interagency team in Washington, USAID was tasked with getting contractors ready to go to hit the ground running in Iraq for various sectors such as reconstruction and, and governance. Uh, USAID used what they called a limited competition system in which the agency personnel selected particular vendors and solicited bids. USAID then selected the winners from what they call from this limited competition and the Bechtel contract, of course, for reconstruction. The infrastructure is probably the best known of these awards that were made. Since then, we've been arguing to the administration and USAID that they need to begin efforts now so the next set of contracts is awarded through full and open competition. And I'm talking about the $20.3 billion that Tom Coralogos just referred to as the part that's in the supplemental for the next round of reconstruction. That's on a track. We're moving rapidly forward with that. But we have no time to lose if we're going to be prepared to make sure those are awarded on a competitive basis. Frankly, there's been some reluctance downtown uh, to do this. In part, I must say, Mr. Chairman, because the, the roles and missions of the U.S. agencies and the Coalition Provisional Authority have never really been sorted out completely. As recently as the subcommittee hearings uh, of, our, of our subcommittee hearings two weeks ago, uh, it was, still was unclear. The administration still hadn't decided who is going to do what in Iraq reconstruction, who is going to administer what parts of the reconstruction effort. The, the regular FY 2004 bill that passed okay. the Foreign Operations Appropriations uh, Committee and uh, for, subcommittee, then the full committee on the floor of the House, included a provision that does require full and open competition. And I'm happy to say, Mr. Chairman, we've been working with you and your staff very closely to develop language for the Iraq supplemental bill that we will right. mark up tomorrow, and I think that language, we've, we've got agreement on Thank that. I, I really just want to conclude with this comment, and I can't overstate the importance of this issue. If we're going to have credibility with the American people, they need to know that uh, American companies, that either they represent or uh, have done their work through the sweat and of the br off the brow of American workers, are going to have an opportunity to, to have a fair shot at securing contracts in the rebuilding of, of Iraq. That's what America is about, uh, open competition, about giving everybody an opportunity. It's about basic American values and doing the right thing. Uh, the perception, the very perception, Mr. Chairman, that we might use something other than open competition would really undercut, I think, uh, the support for uh, the mission of uh, the CPA. There are some good signs. We've heard some of them here today. There's no doubt about it. And I think uh, USAID has gotten the message. Uh, they have recently published a request for proposals for $1.5 billion in additional construction projects. That's in preparation. And I'm glad to see that in preparation for the fact that this $20.3 billion will be coming. Clearly, there are emergency situations that may require sole source 
or other and fully competitive methods. But I think it's fair to say that the full and open competition ought to be the rule. It's fair and transparent. And I think it usually results in savings to the taxpayer as well. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would thank you again for this chance to be here. If there was an opportunity just to ask one question of Mr. Coral Ogos or any of the members of the panel there, it's do you feel we're ready to win this next round to have true open competition uh, for these uh, contracts? Mr. Chairman, uh, Ambassador Bremer testified before the committee and said yes. Uh, indeed, uh, it will be transparency, it will be open competition, uh, and uh, the process, I think, has already begun. Uh, toward that end. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I certainly hope that that will be the case. I'll be over there in about three weeks, Tom, to uh, visit with you and uh, we'll have a chance to talk some more about this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Colby, thank you very much. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Pomeroy is here and he has some business on the floor, so Mr. I would Chairman, ask unanimous I, consent. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you, are you calling people as to when they, they, they came or how are you? I am calling people. I'm asking the minority staff how they would like me to recognize them. And I'm working with them. So I'm letting you all, your leadership well, the call the shot. If the gentleman has to go to the floor, I'd be pleased to let him go now. I, I, I was the first member here. So. I understand. <laughs> I Mr. Thank, Pom uh, gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Pomeroy, thanks for being here. I, I thank both of my colleagues. I, uh, there is a pension issue on the suspension calendar on the floor now and Ways and Means Jurisdiction. I'm asked to speak on it, so I do apologize for going out of order. And I'll be brief. I uh, went to Iraq in August to the House Intelligence Committee CODEL led by Pete Hoekstra. I especially appreciated the uh, work of Tom Colo Tommy K, we call him, because I have a trouble with that last name, Corologus in the extraordinary time and commitment you made to making certain we saw everything that could be seen. Also very much appreciated the briefing we had from Commissioner Carrick right in the middle of a very busy time for you there. I think it's important for members coming back to draw a very clean line on what we saw and what we therefore could learn from firsthand exposure and what we didn't see and, and, and not assume we, by seeing something that we have an expertise in other areas. In my case, what we saw was extraordinary performance by the military, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, our troops made me so very proud about the resolute way they were carrying out their functions under excruciatingly difficult conditions. It was 133 degrees there one of the days during our trip, and yet there they were, full field rest, Kevlar vest, helmets, getting the job done and not complaining uh, a whit. It was, uh, the, the members of the CODEL had plenty to say about the conditions, but uh, our military escorts uh, uh, performed absolutely uh, as one might expect the highest conditions of the military. That was reflective, I believe, of what we saw in troop performance right across the board. We're also very impressed about military leadership. The division commanders impressed us a great deal. And in fact, some of the ad hoc successes that I believe we've seen in the, in the country have been achieved by a great deal of initiative and you know, just flat out creativity uh, of the military division commanders uh, making the best of uh, what was available to them without particular guidance uh, from any central planned uh, authority. So for the military component of it, really the highest, uh, highest uh, thoughts of, uh, relative to being impressed. We were unable to see, due to the security conditions, circumstances. We didn't visit with one Iraqi, not one, Iraqi, not, not one member of the Provisional Council. Uh, that was a significant flaw to the trip. It really left us with just half the picture. Uh, in visiting with uh, Ambassador Bremer, Ambassador Kennedy, it was still unclear to me that the, 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 organiza the organization running the reconstruction efforts or the stabilization efforts, whatever you want to call them. Um, Ambassador Bremer, was backstopped by Ambassador Kennedy, but Ambassador Kennedy was a direct report not to Ambassador Bremer, but to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, it appeared that the Office of Secretary of Defense had a very major imprint on the reconstruction efforts, but all of that was shaken up recently, and today's Washington Post reports that Secretary Rumsfeld did not learn about the new commission being established in the White House under Condoleezza Rice the President's security advisor, until he received a memo from Condoleezza Rice. Uh, this 
this kind of unclarity, uh, the lack of certainty about, about the structure that I got on the ground in Iraq has only been you know, amplified by what I've been reading in the paper upon my return. It just seems to be a very chaotic organizational structure. And unfortunately, uh, the, the resident expertise in terms of actual program implementation <laughs> residing in the Secretary of State or the State Department, residing in USAID, do not appear to have prominent and well-defined roles in this part of the action. And I think that that has to happen. Uh, finally, we really didn't learn about a well-developed plan. Even going over there, I didn't come back with the sense that we have a global plan we're operating on. And the money requested fills neatly into the specified priorities on a timeline, appropriately sequenced. It, we, we, we learn of ad hoc successes, and now we have a significant, significant budget request. <clears throat> It doesn't all fit together in some kind of framework that really, that really makes sense. Finally, uh, I, I did come away with significant concern about the treatment of National Guard troops. They were called up in North Dakota's instance with five days' notice. When we were there, General Sanchez said we, he was anticipating redeployments in October, November. Two weeks after our return, we learned that the plan is that the National Guard in, in April will remain in country until April. That's a deployment away from their families of 15 to 16 months. I believe that is disastrous for their morale. It is very damaging, hurtful to their families. And I'm not at all sure how we're going to keep National Guard recruitment up in light of this experience, this very serious experience our National Guard soldiers are having. Uh, that concludes my impressions. I have a written statement for the record. Again, uh, my, my, my deepest gratitude to the effort being made on the ground. It's really heroic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone want to respond? Uh, Mr. Brownlee, Secretary Brownlee. Uh, sir, if I could, uh, when I was there just a week or so ago, I specifically went and met with some of the troops of the National Guard who, of course, have had their deployment, their mobilizations extended uh, when the decision, we made the decision to keep everyone there, boots on the ground for 12 months. There were really three factors here. One was that the combatant commander was very interested in continuity and stability of the force and keeping the team together. The, the second factor was predictability for those troops, both active and reserve components. And uh, the, uh, we also uh, have to look at how much, what the resources we have remaining, both within the active and reserve for future rotations. So it all became a matter of trying to balance this and all of the troops that I talked to there from uh, units that were expecting that their deployments would be shorter uh, while they all clearly express as most soldiers do that what they'd really like to do is go home they also acknowledged that they understood their mission and they were perfectly prepared to conduct it and and we understand this creates hardship for the reserve components and I assure you that we continue to look at this and we'll do everything we can in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Sherwood. We're, thank you, we're Mr. recognizing members just everybody. In, in the order you came, we're going to try to get to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hearing. And I just came back from Iraq and a lot of the things that have been said, uh, we certainly agree with. My initial impressions when you fly over were how much water there is, in a, and we don't understand that in this country. And my another initial impression was how little damage our military did to their housing and their structures and their infrastructure. You drive down a street in Baghdad and it looks a lot like Palm Springs in places. They didn't even blow up or cut down the, the Royal Palms. But there, there are some things that I think we've got to pay attention to. and. Uh, Secretary Brownlee, I've got to follow up. Uh, the morale over there in the regular Army people is sky high, but the reservists don't feel they're being treated properly. They're there, they're glad to be there, they're glad to do their job, but they want to tell you about a million little indignities that they feel they suffer under, like having to imp 
uh, input their time manually every time to get their hazardous duty pay. We've got a lot of things that we could do in that regard. What's your comment on that? Uh, sir, I agree. One of the, uh, the things that has impressed me the most about this, and I'm sure you would agree, is how the, the, the forces have acted as a total army, uh, the reserve components and the active components. When you go out there, you can't tell the difference. That's how good they both are. Except and when you talk to them. Sir? Except when you talk no, to them. Uh, sir, I, but, and, and of course, uh, as I said, uh, uh, most soldiers in any war would prefer to go home. But, but again, I was impressed by their commitment. I've said before that I think uh, that what we have here is another greatest generation. The sacrifices they're making, both financial and otherwise, are, are no doubt extraordinary. And uh, and all of them acknowledge to me that uh, while they may have difficulties and they they of course would like to go home, they understand their commitment, their mission, and they're prepared to do that. And as I have said before, we're going to continue to look at each one of these and try to do the best we can. But we have to respond to the command, command, commander's requirements also. And so we're trying to balance that with predictability for the families and the resources that we have. Sir, you entirely missed my point. I'm sorry. Those folks are willing to do what they have to do. They don't like to be there an extra six months, but they're going to do it. But they feel they suffer a great deal of indignities from the regular Army people who don't pay attention, who don't treat them right, they're, they're so willing to do what they have to do. And, and I don't want to belabor this point, but I think we've got some administrative details to work over. The other thing that was impress, uh, impressive to me was what was going on in the North and, and uh, how uh, when a commander has some resources and is able to take control of a sector, he can really get things done. Uh, the, in Baghdad, uh, though, the it was impressive to me. We were at the Aldora power plant. And is there anybody here that can tell me what we're going to do with that monstrosity? We have this huge power plant, which doesn't even have a 50 caliber machine gun hole in it, as near as I could tell. But where there are four huge turbines, there's one that's working relatively well, one that's working about 35 percent, and the other two are shut down. Now, this, we didn't cause this. I understand that. But I think we have a relatively short window to keep the Iraqi people coming our way before we're seen as, as occupiers. What are we doing to get that power plant running? Yes, sir, uh, General Strzok. We are, in fact, working in Aldora right now, sir. We have reactivated uh, UN contracts to rebuild the boilers there, and we're rewinding the turbines, and that power plant is going to be brought back in service. But you're absolutely right, it's antiquated technology, and part of the supplemental is to actually create new generation there, state-of-the-art generation that's reliable and stable. But Aldora is, is very definitely one of the key projects we're working right now, sir. But it was a little surprising to me that with all our resources, we couldn't get that thing cranked up a little better. I mean, that needs some management. That, that needs somebody to go in here and kick ass and take names. It's a mess. Sir, we have that. Uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development has created a project management team headed by Mr. Dick Dumford, who is a power expert, and they're doing marvelous things. In the last month, we've, we've increased generation in the country by about 1,000 megawatts. Aldura is not yet online, but it will be very shortly. That project, that the power plant was down before the war, yes, and, and we'll get it back up. And, and, sir, as far as security goes, I know that that is one of our prime security objectives, and I know that that is being well secured by the U.S. forces there. And Thank you. Wanna, Time I don't want to make Go ahead. one. I don't want anything I've said to be critical of our troops over there. They were the highest caliber. You just can't understand the commitment. I'm trying to talk about the support from the top. Uh, those young men and women are the highest caliber people I've ever been around in my life. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing and thank the panel of witnesses for being here. Um, I have not had the pleasure of visiting Iraq, uh, but would like to know the extent of collateral damage to the Iraqi infrastructure 
uh, by the U.S. military. I mean, was there much damage to hospitals, schools, bridges, and roads uh, during the war? Uh, and are we building or repairing that infrastructure that was damaged? Can anybody? Uh, 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 Congressman, uh, I, I can respond by saying smart bombs work. Okay. They knocked out the military targets. They knocked out the Ba'athist ministries. They knocked out the palaces where uh, Saddam was thought to be. Uh, the infrastructure troubles occurred for two reasons. First, 30 years of mismanagement uh, coupled with sanctions. Saddam used to use them for political purposes. He would shut down electric plants. He would shut down mills and textile uh, facilities for political ideological reasons. In addition, uh, after our soldiers got close, the looting began in all of those areas. The, the population decided that they were going to take it out on, on, the, on the 30 years of repression, and they went in and not only looted, but sabotaged. Uh, what can you loot at a power plant? Yeah. Uh, they took away uh, anything that moved. They took windows out. They took bars off the, do off the windows and, and, <coughs> excuse me, and were using those uh, for uh, their own way of, uh, of, of retribution. So the infrastructure and, and those members that have been uh, to Baghdad and to Iraq uh, was not damaged. It's amazing how little damage was done. And uh, most of the damage that we have, uh, are reaping the whirlwind now in the power plants, as General Strzok said, uh, and even in uh, the ministries around, the prisons and what have you, was all done by looters. So you're telling me that most of the damage was, mi was minimal uh, yes, due sir. to the war. Yes, sir. Let me. Also, Could I just add one thing, sir? Yes, that, sir. Yes, uh, sir? Our military now uses a process called effects-based targeting when we go into these kind of operations, and that is to understand the effect you want to create. <laughs> and sometimes we do have to attack civil infrastructure to deny power to military facilities, for example. The easy way to do it is to take out the power plant. It's big, it's a one-stop shopping, and you can do it quickly. <coughs> the tough way to do it is to take out the transmission lines, but they are much easier to repair post-hostilities, and that's what we targeted, transmission systems, distribution systems, not the generation systems. The only exception, I would say, was the communication systems of the country. In Iraq, the civil communications and military communications are one and the same. And we learned late in the war, while we protect, protected those and did not attack those early on, we learned late in the war that we really had to go after them to accelerate the collapse of the regime. So we did attack the communication structure, which we're now rebuilding. Did you take out many bridges or roads? Only where it was military, military necessity, sir, and those were typically uh, on-the-spot decisions by commanders in combat. Okay. Um, I don't know who can tackle this question, but recently uh, Senator Kennedy, uh, citing a Congressional Budget Office report, said that only about $2.5 billion of the $4 billion being spent monthly on the war can be accounted for by the administration. He, he, he goes on in, his, in this AP story, story to say that uh, my belief is that is this money is being shuffled all around to these political leaders in all parts of the world bribing, bribing them to send in troops. He said, now, I, don't, I don't know if I want to use that strong of a term, but can either any of you explain to this committee and account to this committee for where the other money is going if 2.5 billion is going to the troops. Where is the other one and a half billion going? Can, can anybody, or is it national security considerations? I, I'm, not a, I'm not a budget officer, Congressman, except to say that uh, we have uh, inspectors general, we have GAO uh, over there. Uh, an OMB even had a, had a, a representative there. We, we account for every dime that's spent. Having said that to you, there are, two, there are two funds that we were using. First, we had the vested and, and seized assets that Saddam had uh, put in plastic bags and was trying to take them out of the country as he fled. Uh, that was Iraqi money, and the vested assets that we have taken from other countries that he owed them, that, that he had in banks, and have used that to restore Iraqi structure. And what happens with that money it, it is money that 
uh, the coalition presents to the commanders in the field to go around and repair schools, repair soccer fields, repair uh, whatever damage has been done, clean up uh, environment uh, uh, garbage areas. Uh, this is called uh, a, a rollover fund, which is not appropriated. Uh, Mr. Colby was there, and we showed him some of those projects, as we, sh as we other members of the committee. Uh, that money also is accounted for. Uh, it does not go through the regular appropriation process because it is Iraqi money that we're using for uh, Iraqis at, uh, at the discretion of the commanders in the field and the new ministers that have been formed to say, we need this, we need that. And it's a rollover account that, uh, that the, it goes okay. down to the brigade commanders, I think, doesn't it, okay. Mr. Carl? Yes. Okay, thank you. I thank you for your answers. It seems like a pretty fast clock, Mr. Chairman. Thank yeah. You. Goes to time, time flies sometimes. I just want to make one comment that may, may help the gentleman. As we drove through Baghdad and, and, and the areas that were heavily bombed, how little damage there was. It was a normal city up and operating, and once in a while you would see a pile of debris here or there, and there was, those were generally military installations or governmental installations that we had bombed with precision. Nobody wages conventional war as well as we do. Nobody has ever done it as well. That is very clear. The problem is, of course, the aftermath. Uh, when, when we're sitting there in, in a occupying a st status, it becomes a lot more difficult. Uh, and, uh, but the conventional war, all of the uh, predictions we heard about mass casualties, it didn't come true. They did an outstanding job there. Um, recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Tehart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also had the opportunity to go uh, with Mr. Sherwood, Mr. Shimkus, and others to Iraq about a week and a half ago. And I was uh, a little bit shocked to find out that the country wasn't in chaos like they were reporting on the news, that the criminals were not controlling the streets, and the lights and water were actually on. So I was a little bit surprised. Uh, one thing that I did notice is that uh, we have troops over there who do an excellent job. And we have uh, our generals and those in, in uh, charge over there have excellent plans in place. But there seems to be a lack of interagency support. Now, I'm told that there's good cooperation over in Iraq, but we have um, people in our military training border guards. I think the INS probably has more experience doing that job. We have uh, people in our military who are training police officers. We probably have FBI agents that have more experience in those areas. Uh, we have uh, military people teaching them how to become highway patrolmen as far as Iraqis are concerned. And I, and I thought, well, we may have some reservists that have highway patrol experience, but in general, we have um, uh, the military taking on a whole lot of tasks besides trying to bring peace and security to the country. And it just seems to make sense to me that we should have more interagency cooperation, that we should have um, personnel from these other agencies that have experience along those lines do the training with the Iraqis rather than put that burden on um, an overloaded workforce right now in the military trying to bring, bring peace to the place. So I if you could uh, sort of let me know um, what you think, whether there is cooperation, is it increasing, do we have plans to increase it, or are we just going to uh, tolerate the status quo? Uh, no, sir. It's, um, it, we have made a number of requests um, to the FBI, uh, to the Department of Homeland Security, and they are dispatching um, people from the United States to assist us in training the Iraqis. On the border and customs uh, side, we will be getting agents, and we've ha had agents. In fact, when we, uh, when we put together the team that stood up and, and put together the Baghdad airport, uh, we had United States customs agents come in to train the Iraqis on the, uh, on the Pisces system and, and other systems that we would need to be in place for us to open up the airport at Baghdad and Basra and in the north. Um, those programs are continuing. Uh, we have had the military assist us in the area of in-service training, in the transitional training. We brought back, as you may know by now, uh, nearly 40,000 police officers. Uh, there were several more uh, pre-war. Uh, many of them, most of them probably, that did not come back, didn't come back because they were violators of human rights. They figured they would be arrested um, some came back and they were terminated or fired or, uh, or retired. Um, se several were members of the Ba'ath Party, the senior levers of the Ba'ath Party, and they were removed. Um, we have created a three-week transitional program, and that's what the military police 
are assisting in the training of, and that's to make sure that the people that we have brought back, reinstated, um, are learning principles of policing in a democratic society. And, you know, simplistic things like police patrol and understanding that an interview and an interrogation doesn't mean that you hang someone up by, upside down by your feet and beat them until they're unconscious. Um, those things have to be taught to the people that are on the ground right now, and that's what we're doing with the help of the military. But as the program continues, and as the President mentioned last Friday, we are now going to be working with the Jordanian authorities to train the Iraqis that we are recruiting to stand up the rest of the police. We need an end state number between 65 and 75,000 civil police and probably another 15,000 border and customs officials to secure the civil end of the, uh, the country. Uh, those, tr those people that have to be trained, recruited, and vetted will be trained in Jordan with the assistance of the Jordanian uh, police and military. And that program is continuing. So we are working with, um, and just one last point, there is an eight-week training program for the police that will be trained in Jordan, but they will come back into the, into the country of Iraq, and for six months they will have uh, field training officers assigned to them. Those will probably be people out of the United States in some of the other 37, 35 countries that are working in Iraq. Uh, we now have Italians, Poles, Spanish, mm -hmm. Uh, of more than 30 countries that we're working with as a part of that program to train them when they come back into the country. One of the things that uh, we did while we were in, in Iraq was tour the Aldura power plant, which was mentioned by Mr. Sherwood. It was a, it's a, like a 1950s, 1960s old power plant put in place by the Germans, and uh, they're getting, trying to get it back up and running, I suppose, as a holdover because there must be much, much more efficient power generating facilities. I know we have peak power plants in America, we have municipal power plants that are cheaper, less capital, much more efficient, and we ought to be looking at that rather than, you know, build, rebuilding this <coughs> 1950s technology. I mean, that makes about as much sense as flying these old tankers when we could be flying KC-767 tankers, at least from the, you know, uh, for the Air Force. So we ought, we ought to be thinking, you know, what's the best technology available and not uh, being stuck in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Mrs. Norton, thanks for being patient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I think we all agree when we say turn the country uh, back to the Iraqis, we, we mean first democracy and then turn over their own economy to them. Um, and I, I have uh, my questions go far less to to uh, contracts for American con companies than contracts for Iraqi companies, particularly since there are numerous press reports that now that Iraqi business people are talking to the press about how they feel shut out of our contracting process, and they complain that they could do the work for uh, many times uh, less than the work is being done. Now, I don't know if this involves the ability of our own companies or our own our Army Corps of Engineers to translate uh, price bids as between uh, our companies and their companies. Obviously, they will underbid us all the time, uh, given the difference in uh, the economies. But how do you deal with these complaints? How do you respond to these complaints? That they know their country, they can do the work for a whole lot less then we are doing it, and they're not getting the contracts. Good morning. Um, just, I, I want to talk about the Ministry of Interior, for example, for one moment. Um, I, and I've heard and I've read some of the things in the newspapers, and I've heard some of the, the criticism. In the Ministry of Interior, for example, in the city of Baghdad, we stood up 35 police stations in four months faster than anything you could have done in the United States, and we did so with Iraqi contractors. We did so in I'd buildings. I'd like a response to this question. Uh, in other words, are you saying that, it is that, that th this is all anecdotal and that they are, in fact, you're, uh, you, I want to know about the ability to translate the price information so that the Iraqis understand uh, why, for example, we are paying more than they, than they have bid. Because, you know, the same, in this country, if you bid 
and you have the lower bid, you don't get the work, then you think something's crooked. So I'm trying to find out whether or not we have the capacity to make them understand our bidding process and to translate their bids to meet uh, our system, or what is the reason for these reports that are cropping up everywhere with complaints from Iraqi business. But I don't doubt that you're able to build. I don't doubt that you're using Iraqi business people. I'm asking a more technical question about how the bidding process works when you're dealing in a foreign country with people with, with, with a bidding process that is very different from the one we use here. Well, ma'am, I can't comment. I, I'm not aware of any case where bids have been received and, and uh, it did not go to the low bidder unless it was a best value sort of contract. So I don't know any specifics on that. I do know we're making great efforts, though, to employ as many Iraqi companies as we can. One of our problems early on was the fact that most of the infrastructure-related co companies in Iraq are state-owned enterprises, and as parts and extensions of the government, they suffered the same amount of uh, destruction and devastation as the rest of the economy. And so to even get them to mobilize and be prepared to, to come to, uh, uh, to work was very, very difficult. And that's getting better and yeah, better I all the time. I, actually, I, I, I very much appreciate what you're, you're doing in, in trying mm -hmm. to deal in a foreign country, trying to get the work done quickly. Uh, let, let me suggest this. Among, among the complaints I've read, again, these are, these are the Iraqis talking to the press, um, that, for example, the bidding period is so short, a couple of days, that they can't possibly deal with that kind of, of turnaround. There have been complaints uh, that the information on the solicitations are inaccurate and misleading. As somebody's doing these solicitations, don't even understand uh, the country and understand what needs to be done. Uh, there are complaints that, um, that because the bidding process opens and closes so quickly, probably, because you're trying to get the work done quickly, it looks like a prefix set up and that you've already chosen. Now, let me just say something to you. I'm on another subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the GSA. Mm -hmm. In this country, the GSA has to do weekly meetings in order to tell people how to get on the GSA schedule and how to bid. And what I want to know is whether you are doing the job of bring, uh, that it will take to bring Iraqis into the process, or if you're just throwing out a bid and saying we need a response within two days, how do you expect people to be able to bid, especially when you look at figures like Bechtel, which has $900 million of contracts and only $50 million in subs to Iraqis? Uh, part of the reason may be that we haven't done our job in informing, teaching, training Iraqis how to use our bid process, so you just simply go on with whoever looks like he can do it and, and gets the work done. So I want to know what you're doing to bring them into the process so they know, so they know how to become a part of the process you're using. Ma'am, the uh, Bechtel Corporation did hold a, a uh, session for all Iraqi contractors about two months ago to explain the opportunities and processes to compete. And there are some challenges, many of which are associated with just the lack of communication in the country, the inability to even know what, when there are opportunities presented. So that's definitely a problem we're working on. I know that uh, under the, uh, when the supplemental comes through, there is a plan afoot that will have as part of the performance specification the contractor's plan to employ Iraqis and how they're going to go about doing that, educating them on the process and then actively soliciting their support. So I, we are very aware of that this is a problem and we're working on it. I wish you'd Thank make you. the committee, I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I wish you'd make the committee aware of how you inform in writing of how you inform uh, um, contractors that they are to, <laughs> in turn, inform Iraqis of how to use this process so that we have a greater understanding of, of what you are doing to bring Iraqis into your own bidding and contract process. Yes, that would be we'll, helpful we'll to get that information to us. Yeah. We'll circulate could to I, members. Could I respond for just a moment? So sure. Because the Army is the executive agent to assist. Put, I can't hear you. Oh. Go ahead. The Army is the executive agent to assist the uh, Ambassador Bremer's organization with contracting. Could I please provide for the record how we're doing that and what we intend to do to try to make sure the process is perceived as fair and transparent by both U.S. and Iraqi companies? That would be very useful, I believe. We'll do uh, that. Thank That'd you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Uh, gentleman from Connecticut. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to take the opportunity first to thank you for holding these hearings, thank all of our patriots at the, uh, who are our panel, and thank them very much, and to recognize Dr. Julian Lewis, who is a member of Parliament. If he would stand uh, from Great Britain, we appreciate um, your great country's help in this effort. Thank you. Welcome to the committee room. I, um, I hope I, he enjoys his stay over here in the colonies, so uh, thank you. <laughs> In my, uh, in my first visit to Iraq, I met a gentleman in Umgasa who said, his name was Mohammed Abdul Hassan. He said, you don't know us and we don't know you. And that spoke volumes to me in this rebuilding effort. Winning the war on a scale of one to 10 is an 11. Uh, winning the peace, I don't know where it is, but it's not an 11 or a 10, maybe not even a nine, and we need it to be up much higher. I'd love to ask you, not because I agree with all of his criticisms, but because I think you should respond to them. In the next panel, we have Dr. Ala Haidari, and he basically expresses gratitude for the United States coming into Iraq. He's an Iraqi American, and he then proceeds to be somewhat critical. I'm going to state his criticisms up front and then have you just uh, respond to them. One of them is, he said, the, governing, the current council makeup, the governing council, simply does not reflect Iraqi reality. Uh, he said, sadly, most of the members of the current council have neither the support nor the approval of the people in their respective groups, nor does the current council provide any representation for many Iraqi provinces and so on. In disbanding the army, he said, Iraqi police forces must take over as soon as possible. I think you've spoken somewhat to that. He said the U.S. administration must accept the fact that disbanding the Iraqi army and police force was a huge mistake. His other point is that uh, on ministry employees, he said qualified Iraqis are more knowledgeable than anyone else in the affairs of their country and can quickly determine the steps needed to rebuild the economy. And he said except for the top echelons of Ba'athist leadership, it is essential that employees of the Iraqi ministry be rehired. And finally, um, so those are his basic points, and I'll just end by saying when I met with uh, Colonel Buhani, who was the individual who allows us to go into Iraq from Kuwait, he said, you Americans don't get it. You need to be hiring more Iraqi Americans. You need people who speak the language, and you need people who know the culture, and you know, need people who know the tribes. Uh, and uh, so I'd love you to respond to that. And just a quick uh, first question to you, Mr. Korologos. Why should you basically be answerable to defense? Why shouldn't you be answerable to state? I've never quite figured that one out. Well, the short answer is because Congress passed a law creating the supplemental the first time in March and uh, placing the, uh, the uh, coalition provisional authority under the Secretary of Defense, or under the President, reporting through the Secretary of Defense. Uh, you saw when you were there, Mr. Shays, the commingling of the coalition forces and the uh, coalition joint task force seven, which is General Sanchez. We're in the same building. We use the same lunch rooms. We use the same facilities. Uh, they're an integral part of each other's operation. Uh, the soldiers and the commanders out in the field are rebuilding through their civil affairs operation a great deal of the country. Uh, the coalition provisional authority through creating the general counsel and the ministers who are now uh, operating our, uh, creating a governance side. All of us are working on the security piece, which is a, a huge uh, undertaking. Uh, and the commingling and the putting them together uh, works a lot better for, for reporting purposes. There is a big State Department presence, as yeah, you saw. Could you t uh, I'm sorry, could you just get on to the, I think you answered the question. Could you get on to the other points that were made uh, by our, our panelists? the second panelist, the, the quotes that I did, could some people respond to those? The issue of the ministries, the issue of the representation of the, uh, of the council not being true. Can people address that, please? Go ahead. I can address that, or at least Thank you. I hope in part. Um, with respect to the council not reflecting reality, uh, in fact, that's true. The council, uh, we have to remember, is an interim body. It was selected, not elected. It did not, does not perfectly reflect um, Iraq's population. Um, it was necessary to get 
a body in place as soon as possible. A lot of work went into that. I don't want to minimize that. The Council does, broadly speaking, reflect Iraq's general makeup. Um, it's not perfect. And I think the Coalition and Ambassador Burma in particular are making a, a, an enormous effort from now to reach out to those parts of the population who believe they may not be perfectly represented on the Council. Because at the end of the day, what will represent the Iraqis is an elected government, not something that's been appointed in any case. Thank you. That's helpful. How about the issue of the ministries? Um, we take the point that the people who know how to run Iraq are probably Iraqis. They know where the keys are. They know where the supplies are. They know, they know the people, and they know the language. It's their country, after all. Uh, I think CPA is making an enormous effort to get the ministries up and running and to bring back those employees who are necessary to make the ministries run. I think that's a priority. It's not a high-profile priority, but it's definitely, go it's definitely happening. I know my time's up, but maybe in the course of uh, this panel they can address uh, some of those questions that were raised by the next panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all of you uh, for being here uh, today. As you all know, we have a request of about $20 billion uh, asking the American taxpayer to help with construction, reconstruction in Iraq. That's on top, of course, of billions that have been spent and billions that probably will be spent in the future. Uh, given that, I think we would all agree that we would like to share the financial burden as much as possible with our allies and others in the international community. Uh, we've been working trying to get a resolution out of the United Nations. Uh, the news today looks bad. I mean, the reports are that it's, it doesn't look likely uh, that we're going to get a resolution. My question is this. If we, if we do not get a resolution out of the UN uh, Security Council, what is your prediction as to what kind of support we're going to get at the upcoming donors conference in Madrid? And I'd like you to be as specific as possible in terms of what exactly you anticipate in terms of dollars us receiving uh, from other de potential donors? It's very difficult for me to be as specific, uh, give, you, uh, give you specific numbers, because everything, the campaign is now underway to persuade donors to come to Madrid to pledge significant amounts of money, both uh, for the f coming year and for out years. Um, the needs are enormous. The UN and the World Bank have either just released or are about to release their needs assessment. Uh, other donors are, will be looking at that and will be looking at specific areas where they can slide in their contributions. Um, I don't think we can abandon that effort, obviously, no matter what happens to the Security Council resolution. Um, we need the international community up front. We need them with their checkbooks out whether we come to some agreement in the Security Council or not. Right. Would, you, would you agree that failure to get a resolution in the Security Council will make it more difficult for us to yes. get support? The right. let, me ask, let me ask you this. I mean, we've had some talk about the uh, current uh, Iraqi Governing Council and whether it reflects the country. I, I assume, regardless of exactly how representative they are, it's our goal to uh, enhance their credibility rather than to undermine their credibility. Would that be a fair assumption? Yes, sir. Okay. In, in light of that, um, Given the fact that the, all reports indicate that the, the Iraqi Governing Council does not support the addition of Turkish troops, 10,000 Turkish troops, uh, into the country, will we honor uh, their request if they were to make that, official, that request official? I don't want to speculate on what may be happening now between the Governing Council and the CPA on discussions. What I do understand, however, is that the expression of opposition to the presence of Turkish or other foreign troops uh, in Iraq was the opinion of a single member of the Council, attributing that opinion to everybody else, too. But it was not an official act of the Council. Right. Un understanding that, if, if the Council were to take an official position in opposition uh, to the 10,000 uh, Turkish troops, would we honor that request, given the fact that although they are in a perfect reflection of the Iraqi, as you just said, they are broadly speaking reflective of the Iraqi? The best answer I can give you is that we would certainly weigh their opinion very heavily against the obvious military necessity for the, for the additional troops. Well, it seems to me if we are trying to uh, uh, diminish the view that we are an occupying force that does not represent the will of the uh, Iraqi people, uh, we should honor the request of whatever group exists now that uh, has at least some reflection. Let me ask you this. 
Were, do, do, did the United States make any uh, commitments to Turkey with respect to actions we would take against the PKK in the event that they were to uh, provide their forces? And if so, what specific commitments have we made to the government of Turkey with respect to the PKK? Um, I prefer not to go into specific commitments. In open session, PKK has been uh, an issue for us as a terrorist organization for some time, irrespective of any specific uh, commitments the government of Turkey or may have made to help on Iraq. Well, let me ask you this. Do we anticipate that U.S. forces, as part of our agreement with Turkey, do we expect that U.S. forces will be involved in any military actions against the PKK? Was that part of our understanding with the Turkish government? Sir, I prefer, prefer not to discuss that in open session. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to pursue an answer with you then in closed session that is classified. <clears throat> let, let me just ask one last question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, $9 billion uh, loan to Turkey that has been held up uh, pending this uh, question on forces, that, would that, you expect that to go forward? And is my assumption correct that that is not part of the $87 billion that is in addition to? I don't know the answer, but I'll get it for you. Okay. okay. Uh, if I have a little more time, I'd just quickly like to ask you with respect yeah. to uh, Iran, uh, what what role you see Iran's uh, government currently playing uh, in Iraq? Are they being constructive? Are they undermining our efforts? Uh, what's your what's your assessment of that as of today? It's uh, the role is difficult to assess with any precision because it's amb it's ambiguous. The official, the, the Iraqi government has come out in support uh, with a statement of objectives that are broadly consistent with ours. Stability in Iraq, they have supported the, the establishment of the Governing Council, um, all of which is positive. However, we also note that there are present in Iraq um, elements of the Iranian government whose purpose is not obvious to us and who may be positioning themselves to, to undertake activities that are not consistent either with our objectives or the stated objectives of the Iranian government. So it's, a, it's hard to assess with any real okay. precision at this point, but we are watching very carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just Thank like you. to say that I would like to follow up later uh, with, on some of these questions uh, okay. that were raised. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing us to, to join with you in this hearing today. Uh, I want to mention a couple things. I will try to go quickly. Uh, Rick Jenkins, Dave Brown, John Agoglia, Ben Hodges, Mike Lennington are all classmates of mine from West Point, uh, all full colonels serving in theater. I got a chance to visit with them all and I am very proud of their service and I think they are really reflective of what the Army and, and everybody is doing over there. Um, and I just want them to see that I remembered their name and I mentioned them. Um, uh, I have also been impressed by and I would encourage members to get over there to Iraq. We have had a lot of members go. Um, and what I have been really uh, pleased with is the response of the, from a bipartisan group of members who have who've been on the ground, have seen the need, seen the progress, uh, and are in essence vocally supporting what the uh, emergency supplemental is trying to do, especially the, the $20 billion. Uh, the, the field commanders say this is what we now need to move forward. And I think. Uh, everything that I have read, hearing other people's comments will confirm that. And I would encourage members, there is going to be a lot of opportunities to, to, to go. Uh, third thing is I, I had dinner with four soldiers from the 101st and I said, what one thing do you want me to bring back? One said, Sergeant E5, female from Chicago said, family has to be with us 100 percent. The second one said, this one, a Sergeant E5, was concerned about the care that was being given to an Iraqi friend. Now, he had made a, a friend. He's a truck driver. This Iraqi was injured, and he's just not receiving the same care as a soldier would with, with his. Uh, and I, what a great statement. Here, this soldier is in harm's way. He drives in the community, and he's concerned about an Iraqi citizen. Uh, great comment. Another one said, We're willing to pay the price. They know they are they're in a tough environment. The last one said, America needs to be patient. You can't turn things over overnight. And I want to make sure I put that out on the record. The, uh, what would be, the first question is, what would be the, and this kind of goes with uh, my colleague Congressman Shea's line of questioning, 
What would be the political result if we would move sooner rather than later on turning um, power over to the Iraqi people uh, without a d developed constitution and without really somewhat elections? Who, what party is in the best position to recover and gain control? <laughs> Mr. Dibble or well, Mr. Koroglis? Uh, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, first of all, the religious freedom that has grown as a result of the, uh, the war and the uh, new uh, stature, that the uh, new status that the country has, uh, has created a, a whole group of religious groups around, the Shiites, the Shiites, the Kurds, and what have you. So uh, I, I suppose the short answer is that it would probably end up being a religious uh, Decision. Uh, <laughs> what else was told me on, in theater was that even though the bath is still have money squirreled away, yeah. they're still organized, and you really put at risk a return of the Ba'athist regime, and I think that really makes sense. I want to also turn to one of the other people who make comments in the second panel, um, Biete Serota Gordon. She has this line in her testimony. It says, when General Whitney, General MacArthur's favorite advisor, called in about 20 members of the staff and said, you are now a constitutional assembly, and by order of General MacArthur, you will draft the new constitution of Japan in seven days. Um, which kind of goes to the point of where are we at in Iraq? Uh, you, in essence, have to, we have to move and get a constitutional constitution drafted. And then we have to move to free and fair elections. And that will take time. Now, Really, the, the, the question is, uh, we don't want to push the, the Iraqis too fast and, and, and push our own constitutional you know, positions on them, although that's what happened in Japan. Uh, we want them to have ownership, but we don't want to wait too long. So how do, we, how do we balance that? Because the key to success here will be a, a constitution followed by free and fair elections, and then let the Iraqi people make their decisions. Ambassador Bremer has testified and said uh, that uh, the Iraqi constitution will be written by Iraqis. Uh, they have already, the UN, the uh, governing council has appointed a constitutional preparatory committee that is uh, going around uh, getting advice and counsel from these advisory committees throughout the country on what they may want in the Constitution. Uh, that process is underway now. Uh, we don't want to put a timetable on it. Will it happen in three months? I doubt it. Will it happen in three years? No. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that, uh, uh, Secretary Powell uh, said, and all of us hope, that it happens sooner rather than later. Uh, the sooner the Iraqi Constitution occurs, the sooner you have an election, uh, which means when we turn over the reins of the government to the Iraqis. So that process is underway, and it, I say again uh, that it will be written by and for Iraqis. Uh, thank, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your uh, diligence in allowing me to, to join you here today. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for calling this hearing. And I also want to thank the witnesses for they're coming to testify and share with us this morning. Let me also express my appreciation to our soldiers and all of those who are on the ground in Iraq, uh, given of the highest order of their service as well as the indefinite uh, situation of, of what may very well take place and happen to them while they're there. And so I appreciate all of the efforts that are being made to try and reconstitute and rebuild this country. I want to get back to the line of questioning that had been started by uh, Delegate uh, Norton relative to contracting, which seems to be very complex and very difficult and, and hard to understand and hard to get at. And while I can certainly understand the fact that we need to be on a fast track that is, things need to move pretty fast uh, uh, with some rapidity. And also the complexity of what is needed in many instances to rebuild 
what, what has been torn down or what did not exist in the first place. Iraqis have expressed uh, concern about not really understanding how they can get cut in or if there is opportunity to do so. I'm concerned as to whether or not, um, as we deal with this complexity, is there any room for small businesses? Is, is there any room? I mean, we've developed a concept in this country that, that small businesses, uh, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, ought to have an opportunity to participate in economic development activity, although that's not the main reason for the redevelopment but there ought to be those opportunities. And so my question is, what kind of opportunities exist for small businesses and, and minority and women-owned businesses to participate in the rebuilding of Iraq? Uh, Congressman, there is in the uh, plan that we have uh, submitted to Congress a request for uh, a good deal of money for something called essential services and infrastructure. And the objective is to restore to acceptable standards and try and create a civil society uh, to improve the, uh, provide the foundation from which Iraqis can rebuild Iraq. In that piece, uh, we have just, uh, I guess it's been a month now, uh, the central bank has opened, has already started making small business loans. Uh, they're starting to just in, I think, on the 15th of October, and going to distribute the new currency. Uh, this was an economy that was flat on its back. They had 50 percent, 60 percent unemployment before the war. Uh, we have made every effort to start up small businesses. It's our feeling that small businesses are going to be the basis for the restoration of this country. From the small businesses are going to, you're going to get political input and political. Uh, 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 extensions so that they can start governing themselves. There is a big effort. Small business is a big piece of what we're doing. And today, uh, in Iraq, you can uh, walk or drive down the streets and see, uh, as those of the members that have been there, uh, huge uh, marketplaces that are selling, as I said in my statement, uh, satellite dishes. They're selling shoes. They're selling refrigerators, air conditioners, uh, commodities that have not been available to the Iraqi people, all of them uh, run by small businesses. Well, let's talk about American companies that might want to try to get a piece of the action that Bechtel and Halliburton are getting. I mean, we've got these big umbrella contracts, and they are indefinite uh, in terms of delivery or indefinite relative to quantity of what they are to provide and what they are to deliver. Are there any ways to assure that, that American small businesses can, can, can interact with the Halliburtons and the Bechtels of the world and get a piece of these large umbrella contracts? The answer to that is that Bechtel and the big umbrella companies have held seminars both in the United States and in Europe. At one, that I recall, there were 2,500 subcontractors showed up. Uh, to get in on the process and how to, how to do this. Uh, understand something else here. All the contractors that have come through Iraq and by hopeful uh, guidance from the Coalition Provisional Authority have been asked to make sure that Iraqis are put to work on these projects. Uh, there was one contractor, I understand, who wanted to bring in some Pakistanis to do some uh, labor tasks, that contractor was turned down and said, no, you must go out and hire Iraqis, even to the extent that we are paying Iraqis uh, to go dig irrigation ditches, to go uh, clean up streets, uh, restoring pension plans and what have you. So the whole effort is aimed at getting people to work. Now, I understand and you understand that when you build a bridge or build a uh, restore something, that project is over, and we've got to find something else for them to do after that. Uh, but small business and, uh, has, a, has an input, and I'll let General Strzok comment on the uh, bidding process that uh, has been made. 
through these uh, contract uh, service uh, seminars that have been held throughout the U.S. and Europe uh, uh, in order to spread the, uh, the, the subcontracts around. I can't add much more to that, sir, except to say that it's just standard practice in the Federal Acquisition Regulations that we include a, a component of small business opportunity. And I, again, we can provide that for the record about the specifics of how we're doing that. But I know it's certainly encouraged, as Mr. Korologos has said, that is a, a fundamental aspect of the economic stimulus package that uh, is being discussed in CPA, is how to encourage small business entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your answers, although we know that standard practices do not really work for small businesses and minority-owned businesses, and, and so I appreciate your answer. Okay. Thank sir, you, can Mr. I just Davis. Add one thing, sir? Uh, sure. There, there, is also, there are also efforts within the Army's divisions just to demonstrate uh, innovativeness and ingenuity and desire to help, there are efforts within these divisions to go out and assist in standing up small businesses so they are capable of bidding for some of these contracts. And that's being done by the Army within their respective AOs, areas of operation. Chair, would recognize Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for your important testimony. I'm, you've helped remind us that uh, there is another point of view, a reality of what's going on in Iraq, and helps us understand that economic and social instability breeds vulnerability, and of course uh, that is the roots of terrorism and how they were, for example, with the Taliban and al-Qaeda able to lay such a strong foundation in Afghanistan after the Soviet Union played cut and run, or how um, a effort that was more focused on punishment than rebuilding uh, after World War I led us into World War II and gave birth to the likes of Hitler and Mussolini and, and others that um, ended up killing millions. So we have a lot of work to do. I want to focus primarily on some of the health issues, if I may. Uh, we have heard that prior to the war, many medical supplies, humanitarian assistance that was sent to Iraq was diverted by Saddam Hussein, perhaps personal use or some other uh, uses there. And um, some, had some testimony that um, <clears throat> the number of clinics and hospitals is, is growing and improving, as well as vaccinations. I, I wonder if you could give me a little more detail on pre and post uh, war conditions of hospitals and clinics in Iraq uh, in, in terms of were they filling needs before and, and what is happening now with that? I'm not sure who would answer that one. Perhaps Mr. Korologos. Well, uh, there has been, when, when, the, when the war ended, we fully expected several things to happen. We expected a food crisis, refugees, health crisis, a, uh, the oil fields to be burning, uh, flooding. None of those happened. Uh, the health crisis uh, was a creation of Saddam not funding any health projects. It, it, before the war, as I said, he budgeted $13 million for health care in 2002, which came to about 50 cents per person. Uh, we have struggled and, and have sent in more than 9 million tons of health uh, equipment, oxygen, uh, beds, and what have you. The health thing, when Ambassador Bremer and I first got there, uh, we visited hospitals. They were horrible. It was open windows, flies, the, health condi the uh, sanitary conditions were were as grim as you can imagine. Uh, we still take congressional delegations to those same hospitals, and they came back, come back aghast at how bad they are. And I hate to say you should have seen it till we fixed it. Uh, they are still as, uh, way below any standard that we have all come to know. Uh, we're doing our best uh, to, to rebuild the hospital structure. We, they have a, a very excellent medical operation uh, that had existed in, in Iraq. One of the other things that's interesting that happened is Saddam forbade anybody from attending international conferences. So the entire science community, including doctors, was forbidden from leaving the country to attend any seminars to find upgrades in, uh, in, in the medical treatment. Uh, well, the first, one of the, the first things Ambassador Bremer did was open the doors to let uh, this very uh, uh, brilliant, I must say, medical operation that had running this thing under those circumstances to go find out what's new. 
Is, how uh, so are we, how healthcare are we with uh, is, is uh, uh, a big priority, uh, has been. Uh, we have opened uh, all the hospitals. We have opened clinics. The budget that uh, we have uh, requested shows a huge uh, increase in uh, uh, requests for uh, health facilities. Uh, we have asked for uh, clinics, hospitals and what have you all over the country and uh, our hope we can get there. Is, is there an adequate number of physicians, uh, nurses, uh, medical staff in Iraq or is there also a need for people? I, I didn't hear you. Sorry. I was, I'm wondering if there is adequate numbers of medical staff and physicians in Iraq. Is there also a need for people? I, I don't know how to answer that. Probably not. Uh, given the uh, conditions that I have seen in the hospitals, they could always use more. Uh, it's going to take, there's a lot of NGOs uh, that have come in to provide assistance. Uh, I can't give you a precise answer, but just in observing when you're at these hospitals, uh, the crowds that are outside, the lack of uh, wheelchairs, for one thing, the lack of uh, the, the deterioration of the hospitals uh, is, a, is a horrible thing to observe. And uh, one of the first things we've got to do is start uh, building uh, the facilities in which these doctors can start functioning. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to perhaps request that we, if we could get um, more information, I would appreciate on such things. I know there's been uh, programs of more inoculations and vaccines provided uh, information on what are some of the risks, uh, the disease risks that continue on there and other medical needs. Uh, I, I certainly think that not only the, um, we need to know for future budget reasons, but I also have to think the American people would like to know uh, because that's something we can all identify with and our hearts go out to folks who have been subjected for so many decades to um, uh, a medical disaster. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Tierney. I thank the chairman. Thank all you gentlemen for your testimony and for the work that you are doing. But I think this recent addition of, uh, of time pretty much says a lot of what the American people are thinking. The mission is not accomplished and how Bush and the President misjudged the risk of fixing Iraq. I don't think anybody raises issue with the performance of our troops or the, the military aspects of, of winning the battle. The fact is the total misjudgment, apparently, uh, of what it was going to take to go in and put this thing on solid footing. Uh, in May 1, 2003, clearly the mission was not accomplished. We've had 170 deaths of United States soldiers since that date. We've had many, many wounded. Uh, and to my knowledge, I'm not aware that the President has visited any of these returning uh, wounded soldiers to this country. We've had two potential Iraqi leaders assassinated. Uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello of, of the United Nations has been killed. The oil flow, which uh, this administration told the American people would be used to fund uh, reconstruction, is, is in some days doing less than one half of what it was producing uh, pre the war. Uh, and all the administration says is that uh, there are challenges greater than we anticipated. Uh, you know, that probably should not be the case. And I don't know, Mr. Colleague, uh, Carl Logos, you want to tell us, was there too much reliance by this administration on Mr. Chalabi or people like him? Or how was it uh, that with the intelligence they claimed to have had and all the information they claimed they knew about this country pre-entry, uh, that we now hear a story that they, they say there were things that weren't anticipated? Well, first of all, Congressman, the President has visited the troops, uh, the, the wounded troops uh, here in the, in the, in the hospitals. Uh, so that, I want to set the record straight on that for, for, for a moment. Uh, there, there are problems. Uh, the, the, the war ended, uh, quite frankly, uh, and I say this with careful thought, the war ended too soon. What I mean by that is that as we got closer to Baghdad, uh, the Ba'athists and the Fedayeen disappeared and melded into the population. And they took their AK-47s with them. And they still harbor hope of trying to come back. And our soldiers today are out there in dangerous missions trying to root them out. I also must say very quickly that it's in what we call the Sunni Triangle, which is an area between Tikrit and Baghdad and over to Ramadi, where most of these problems occurred. That's about 1 or 2 percent of the country. And it's about 1 or 2 or 3 percent of the population that has turned uh, in the hope that they might uh, returned back to uh, their old glory days. Uh, the poll that the New York Times and the Zogby people had uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, uh, showed that there is support for what we're doing. Uh, those of you that have been there have seen the, the, the population and the children on the streets waving at our soldiers and waving at us as we go by. Yes, there are problems. Uh, three security issues have arisen. First of all, those people that were Ba'athists and Fedayeen that disappeared into the population. Second, 
the 100,000 uh, prisoners that Saddam released uh, 10 days or two weeks before we got into Baghdad. Those are all murderers and thugs. We're trying our darndest to get them back. There were no records, no computers, and no files on who these people were. Yes, there were some political prisoners, but most of them were uh, uh, criminals. And if you can imagine a criminal being put in jail in Iraq, he must really have been bad. So those guys are out there doing damage to us. And the third element, as the military will tell you, is the outsiders who seem to be wanting to come in here from Iran and Syria and disrupt and throw uh, oil on troubled waters. So that security issue uh, is one that has taken a lot of emphasis and a lot of support from the General Sanchez and our soldiers over there, and it is a problem with the coalition. And it is a problem uh, with the, uh, oh. uh, the foreign uh, uh, groups of the, the UN. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, think, that, Mr. Carlegie, anybody disputes that we have problems. I think the issue was, and my question been around the, the failure to plan ahead of time and, and to do this. And I think now, in the face of this $87 billion request that confronts the American people, people want to know, apparently, we didn't have a plan going in. What's the plan now? Uh, what happened to the 400, almost $400 billion that we have budgeted in our regular Department of Defense budget and the first $69 billion supplemental appropriation? Why do we still hear stories of people being over there without Kevlar vest protection, some of our equipment still needing repair, not from normal wear and tear that should not have been anticipated, but from things that should have been anticipated in an effort when you go in on this basis? And I think that's what people are having a hard time getting their arms around. Why? Should we be looking at passing an entire $87 billion at this point in time when there's some evidence that we have existing funding to take us into next year, that clearly uh, we want to know more about what's happening with internationalizing this effort? And uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Dibble, you can tell us, today's newspapers don't seem very encouraging, but what's happening on the diplomatic front? Do we have anybody else that's going to be coming in to help us out here? What's going on with the uh, international conference in Madrid that's planned for October, or any other country stepping forward going to give us something more than the, the $1 billion, uh, a small amount that we hear about? Candace Miller? My apologies. I would have thought the chairman would have let you answer. Thanks so much. Give me, do you, do you care to answer? I, I thought it was a statement. I'm sorry. I can, I can speak sure. to it in general terms. Um, as you know, the conference Put the mic in Madrid, a little closer to you. I'm sorry. If the conference in Madrid is scheduled for October 23rd and 24th, uh, there, ha there has been a meeting of the core group, which is the essentially the lead donors for this effort, um, just, just early, earlier this week. There is a systematic campaign underway, diplomatic as well as personal, to ensure that we get as much as we can as soon as we can, uh, if possible before Madrid. Uh, to ensure that the burden is adequately spread across, across boundaries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to ask a question. Certainly appreciate the panel for coming today. I've listened to all your testimony here. It's fascinating to hear what's happening in Iraq. And, you know, I think we are at such a pivotal moment in world history, quite frankly. We have the um, the ability, I think, to either get the job done or not, uh, to really have a positive impact on what's happening in the Middle East, positively or, or not. And uh, I think the question for us is whether or not we actually have the political will to finish the job, to reconstruct as necessary, and uh, to do what needs to be done there. And I also believe that the Al-Qaeda uh, certainly have underestimated the resolve of the United States. They certainly underestimated the resolve of George W. Bush. I think they thought that uh, after 9-11, a couple of cruise missiles, we'd go back to our football games or something. They never thought uh, about Afghanistan. They certainly never considered the possibility of what has happened in Iraq. And as I listen to some of you gentlemen talk about uh, the Iranians being a little nervous, I'm, I'm glad to hear those kinds of things. And uh, I think we're having the uh, desired impact on some of these rogue regimes. And I think it's also important, uh, and it was very interesting to hear all of you, I think it's important to continue to point out that the kinds of problems that are occurring in Iraq, that we are encountering in Iraq, are not because of collateral damage, because of the theater there. Uh, if you have uh, inadequate underground, inadequate transmission lines, problems with the water supply, that would have been there whether we went in or not. It's because of the uh, Saddam Hussein uh, regime and what happened there. But my question, and I think uh, this probably to Chief uh, Carrick, if I could, I, I listened to you talk, uh, Chief, about uh, how you were vetting 
the various uh, individuals that were putting into the Iraqi uh, police uh, force there. And uh, I think that is making certain that they have the ability to police themselves is such a critical component for any uh, uh, society, of course. But it's also my understanding that there were several, uh, perhaps two, uh, Republican Guard uh, units uh, that were not engaged uh, during the war. And as you were mentioning, some of these have sort of faded into country. And uh, a free Iraq, of course, to them is a dangerous thing. And so they are apparently the ones that are certainly some of them who are, are causing a lot of the uh, uh, terrorist uh, problems amongst on, in their own uh, country there, amongst their own people. Um, can we be certain, do you feel comfortable that these individuals, who have to be quite intelligent individuals, are not infiltrating uh, the police force and that they don't appear uh, at a later date and manifest themselves with uh, further problems? The, uh, the vetting process, as we have gone through in Iraq uh, from the beginning, um, was by order of the debathification, uh, it was ordered by Ambassador Bremer. Uh, what we did within the police force and the police services, customs, immigration, um, and border services, uh, we took the top three levels of the Ba'ath Party, we eliminated them from the agencies. Um, from that point on, we tried to identify leaders within the agencies, within the different departments, that we felt confident that were trustworthy, loyal, and had integrity and honor. Um, today, the senior deputy minister of interior um, is a man by the name of Ahmed Ibrahim. Ahmed Ibrahim, before he was appointed by me as the senior deputy minister, he was the chief of operations for Baghdad. Before that, he was the commandant of the academy. In all of those positions, um, over about a five, four-month period, uh, we gained an enormous amount of trust in him, beginning with the fact that he had been arrested by Saddam. He had been in prison for more than a year. He had been tortured on a weekly basis. He had been electrocuted. Um, and he was adamant uh, about his opposition uh, toward the regime, toward Saddam and Saddam's loyalist. Uh, in the time that we have been in Iraq and Ibrahim has been in charge of the police service, he has put together special operations units and special enforcement units to go out and hunt down the Fadain Saddam, which are Saddam's trained assassins and killers, to hunt down the former Baathists that are out there committing attacks against the coalition. And what we have found is that if you pick the right Iraqi leaders, they themselves will find the people that they need to get the job done. And I'll give you one example before I, I, uh, I close. I told Ahmed Ibrahim when he had the academy that I didn't want anybody affiliated with the Ba'ath Party or former ties to Saddam involved in the Baghdad Police Department. The next day, I came back to the academy where he had his office, and there were about 1,000 Iraqis outside the gates. He was on the inside with, with a small staff of people. And when I finally got through the crowd and pushed through the gates and got inside, I said to him, what, what is going on? What are you doing? He said, you said no bath affiliations. They're outside. I will pick one by one who is going to work for the new Iraqi police service. And I think that's the key to our success. Let the Iraqis do their job. They know who the Fedayeen is. They know who the Baathists are. They know who the loyalists are. Let, pick the right ones at the top and let them do their job, and that's what we're doing. Thank the gentleman, uh, and thank, thank the you. lady. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Ms. Maloney. Thank you. First, I'd like to welcome Bernard Carrick, uh, the former police chief from the city of New York, who led us so brilliantly after 9-11. Uh, welcome, and I'd like to know uh, how the, the, uh, the members of the governing council are being uh, protected. I was deeply concerned when the woman member uh, was murdered. I've read reports where women cannot even go out on the streets. Secondly, I'd like to thank the chairman for including uh, Mrs. Uh, Beata Gordon, who I think is one of the world's most extraordinary women. Uh, she single-handedly created civil rights uh, for Japanese women. She's on the next panel. And I, I personally believe it would be a disaster beyond words if the women of Iraq are not included in the Constitution with the right to vote, the right to health care, the right to education. It would be a tragedy if women's rights were rolled back because of American invasion. 
I, my my uh, most troubling question is uh, two articles that were in the paper today, and I, I asked permission to put them in the record, and it, it talks about uh, Secretary Rumsfeld not even knowing about the reorganization of the Iraq uh, reconstruction. He is supposed to be in charge of the reconstruction. And I, I deeply believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, that he should come before this committee before we vote on the $87 billion and the reconstruction to give us an update. Without objection, the articles will be put There has the been a lot of talk about contracts. I have a positive story on contracts. When I was in Iraq, I met with uh, General Petralis from the 101st Airborne, and he is doing a remarkable job. He told us this story, that he had a contract. He needed cement to rebuild uh, the houses in the area, and a $15 million contract was given to an American company he kept prodding them, prodding them, prodding them to act. They never acted. So he put on a, on a bulletin board uh, the fact that he needed to build a cement factory. Could anyone help him? And an Iraqi businessman came forward. He used $80,000 from the confiscated money from Saddam Hussein, and the cement factory is up and running. So the story shows, I think, brilliant management. He saved taxpayers' money. And he employed the Iraqi people so they are on our side, not fighting us. And another moral of this story is that you don't have to build the cement factory to American standards. Build it to Iraqi standards. It's working. Let the Iraqi businessman follow the American model of investing his profits into making the business bigger and stronger. And I am disturbed by the fact that one sole source contract to an American contractor of $900 million, only $50 million is contracted to the Iraqi people, employing them and saving taxpayers' dollars. But I, I want to come back specifically with a, an issue that I feel so strongly about. I'm going to place the, the question in writing to the panel. And it concerns the request um, for uh, really uh, rebuilding the oil fields. And according to the supplemental request, the Army Corps of Engineers did a report that said that it would, would cost $1.1 billion to restore the oil production to pre-war levels of 3 million barrels a day. Then the supplemental asks for twice that. And then you include the $1.4 billion that we've already spent. That means that we are paying three times what the final work plan proposed from the Army Corps of Engineers projected. Uh, this shows, I would say, mismanagement. But, uh, you know, I wait for your, for your answers. And secondly, I'd like to place in the record page uh, 28 of the uh, Rehab and, uh, and Reconstruction for Iraq, the CPA Coalition Provision Authority. And in that, uh, it says, and I question this with great sincerity, the funding will also initiate the development of new oil and gas fields. I believe that many Americans would like to help with reconstruction, but I don't think they feel they need to rebuild new fields uh, in another country when we have so many problems at home. Uh, also on page 28, may, may I ask, may, may I put uh, this? If the gentlelady would suspend a second, we just have 30, 20 seconds left. You've got to give them a chance to answer some questions. Okay, just very quickly. It said that funding will allow the commencement of the planned new refinery that will increase domestic capacity. So I'm for, for rehabbing, but are we going to, you know, investing in new, new structures, particularly when the Army Corps of Engineers said it would only cost $1.1 billion. We're now up to $3.3 billion. And uh, I, for one, would like to go back to the Petrales model of doing things uh, cost effectively, saving the taxpayers' money, and employing the Iraqi people. We're going to have Otherwise, a congratulations to the Army for your brilliant uh, bravery and uh, the fine uh, job that you're doing. And I, I met uh, many wonderful um, uh, members of the military from the district that I represent who are really uh, putting their lives in harm's way every day. And uh, uh, the American people are very proud of them. And I am particularly proud of the work that. Uh, um, that the governor, that, that General uh, Odenaro Mr. and General Danklo, Petralis. Can, can I say one thing? Because this, we don't have much time. I think this is very important, uh, Chris. This is very important. Some of the generals told me 
that in creating the, the domestic centers in Iraq, they are putting women on those centers. I think that's incredibly important. I would like a listing from the CPA of all the women who've been put in uh, positions. I think this is tremendously important. And secondly, the point that senators and members of this Congress cannot get the information on the contracts. In all sincerity, I want to be supportive, but we have to have this information before we vote. We have to know where is the money, where was it spent. Petralis gave us the information. The CPA should be able to give us the information. General Petralis did. No, hold on a second, please. Uh, you, you had six and a half minutes. I just wanted to say to you that uh, we'll have a second round, and if you have specific questions, but there was so much to be said. I'm going to go to Mr. Janklo, and then we can come back if you have specific questions that you want to ask him, we'll make sure he answers. Mr. Janklo. Uh, sure. Uh, Mr. Janklo, if you, uh, Ms. Maloney asked a couple of questions. Maybe, yeah. just well, to be fair, points. if anybody wants to respond to her, otherwise, no, no, here, uh, no, she here, said just, she wait, gonna... just wait a second, please. The way we're going to do it is we're going to go to Mr. Janklo. We will come back to Ms. Maloney. She can ask her specific questions, and we'll take them up. She will have her time. She had six and a half minutes to make a statement. Mr. Janklo, you chairman, have the floor. Uh, if I might please, just... please, please don't, Mr. Waxman. Mr. 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 Chairman, Mr. Janklo, if I... Mr. Chairman, yes. I know you like to do what you like to do, but we do have rules. And the rules are that members can take five minutes to ask questions. They could, within that five minutes, answer, ask for responses to the questions. Ms. Maloney did ask some questions. I think we ought to give the panel, if they want to say something to response to some of the questions she asked, give them an opportunity. If they choose not to, they don't have to. Well, Ms. Ms. Maloney did ask for things for the record. Thank you. Mr. This is what I would prefer, and uh, I think Ms. Maloney knows me to be a very fair person. Uh, she had seven and a half, six and a half minutes. I'd like Mr. Janklow to ask questions. We will come back to her. She can ask specific questions, and we will take each one, and I'll be happy to yield her my time on the second round. Mr. Janklow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As you folks can see, we try and put tight timelines on you on getting stuff done in Iraq, and you have to meet it by the deadline, but we have a very difficult time ourselves meeting our own speech deadlines when it comes to... Uh, working within the framework that we have allocated us. You know, back a long time ago, when I was a Marine in the 50s, um, we used to say that we dealt with scuttlebutt, we dealt with rumor in ascending order, we dealt with gossip, uh, we dealt with speculation, and if it was really rank, we called it grapevine. Um, that's what's going on, and I'm picking up from what Mr. Sherwood said about the, the, the issues vis-a-vis -vis the the National Guard and Reserve versus the uh, full-time military. Um, all of us are getting a huge amount of correspondence from our constituents who were called to active duty, who feel, who feel they may not be getting equal treatment in terms of rotations and other things. It may not be the case, but as my mother used to say to me when she sent me to my room, you're going up there not for what you said to your sister, but for the way you said it to your sister. What I'm wondering is, is there a better way, sir, Mr. Ambassador, is there a better way that you can communicate to those troops as to uh, what the policies and procedures are? By the time it gets to their families at home and then it gets to us, it's third or fourth or fifth hand, and it's pretty rank. So, I guess I'm making a statement is what I'm making, but is there, do you think there's a better way the, the military can pursue the information to their troops in the field so at least they get the feeling that, uh, of the reality that they're being treated equal? Because I don't think there's anyone who really believes you're treating the active forces different than the reserves or National Guard you called up, but, the, but people feel they're being treated differently. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, sir, but, you know, and we've been frustrated by this, too, because it seems that there would be a discussion of something, and the next thing you know, it's on the Internet and in the papers and the truth. But, but let me added. give you an example, and I'm interrupting you. I'm yes, being sir, rude, but I, I wrote on behalf of constituents of mine a letter over to the uh, Department of the Army. Yes, I got back uh, June 25th, the most sterile, generic letter you could possibly get dealing with rotations. To the point, I didn't send this back to my constituent. I, I felt all that they would do is become offended by what they felt would be probably bureaucratic runaround. Is there, is, and, and I'll leave a copy of this with I'll you, sir, when I leave, it, but all, my point is, 
you, you need to be a little more hands-on in terms of how you treat people, um, given the fact that you've, I mean, they've been called up a lot over the last uh, eight or ten years. It used to be we called them weekend warriors, and they spent, you know, and, and if there was a big war, they'd be called up. Now they're called up for Panama, and they're called up for Granada, and they're called up to go uh, work with, uh, you know, the, the Norwegian Air Force on a, on a mission, and they're called over to Bosnia, and they're, and they're called, uh, you know, they're being called up all the time, and they're having to drop the plow, and they're having to drop the pen, and, uh, and shut down the cash register, and go off to war, and, and, or a mission, and come home, and that's all well and good. I mean, it was the Minutemen that uh, saved us at Concord Bridge. But the point that I'm making is, it's the way people feel they're being treated as opposed to the way they're being treated. Uh, can you go to work on a better plan? That's sure, all I'm I, suggesting. I assure you that we are. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons we put down the policy we did of 12, up to 12 months on the ground was because we wanted to establish clearly what the policy was and try to stop just what you're discussing, okay. the rumors and those things that are floating around. You know, a another thing, I'm switching subjects now, but and we hear the tragedy virtually every day or every couple of days of, uh, of more American troops being wounded or killed in the theater of operations. I think it would be important for the American people to know, and I wish you'd place it in the record, in the first 12 months after the peace accord was signed on the battleship Missouri, how many American soldiers were killed in the Pacific? It would be important to know how many American soldiers were killed or injured in Europe after the Germans uh, surrendered in World War II. These kinds, it would be important to know how many Americans uh, were injured in other theater of operations. As a Marine in the 50s, I can remember Japanese still surrendering on islands uh, in the Pacific where they'd held out for great periods of time. And so I just think it's important that we put history into perspective that this is not a friendly place. Uh, we had to go over there and invade it and, uh, and trying to bring the pieces and credit. Point. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your interest. Appreciate it. Uh, let me thank this uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do want to have a chance to ask some questions, and I uh, let others go ahead of me out of courtesy to them. But as I indicated earlier in my opening statement, based on the information I've received from many different sources, I'm concerned that taxpayer money is being wasted in Iraq. A billion dollar contracts are going to well connected companies like Halliburton and Bechtel when the work could be done much more cheaply by, by local Iraqi companies. And I want to go through some examples. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, and Ms. Maloney mentioned, that uh, the general in charge of northern Iraq, uh, Major General David Petraeus, told a congressional delegation that included my staff that it would cost $15 million to bring a cement plant up to, uh, uh, up to working. And uh, uh, he, he ended up giving that to local Iraqis to do and it cost only $80,000. Another example, according to Judge Wail Abdu Latif, a member of the Iraq Governing Council from Basra, Western contractors charged approximately $25 million to refurbish 20 police stations in Basra by providing new doors, windows, paints, and paint and furniture. And Judge Abdul Latif contends that a qualified Iraqi company could have done the work for just $5 million. Ms. Songul Chapuk, another member of the Iraqi Governing Council and a civil engineer, described an instance in which the uh, Coalition Provisional Authority renovated 10 houses in Baghdad for council members at a cost of $700,000. Ms. Chapuk believes an Iraq firm, Iraqi firm could have built 10 houses from scratch at that price and employed more Iraqis in the process. The estimates from the CPA confirm this point. According to the CPA, when the work is done by Iraqis, and I quote, cost of construction is one-tenth the U.S. standard per square foot in general construction, end quote. Now, despite the fact that we're overpaying U.S. contractors like Halliburton and Bechtel, there seems to be almost no attention being given to restructuring how we are awarding contracts to take advantage of low-cost Iraqi contractors. The CPA's justification for the $20 billion supplemental, for example, contains no discussion 
about how to restructure these contracts. So, uh, General Strzok or Mr. Karologos, why aren't you doing more to reduce costs to the U.S. taxpayers by using local Iraqi companies? Whichever one of you wants to respond. I'm going to yield to General Strzok, who, who does the contracting. The, the short answer, uh, Mr. Waxman, is that uh, uh, when we first got in there and found this devastation and found this, uh, uh, the economy flat on its back, we had to get started. We had a security problem. We had to get uh, this country off the ground uh, quickly. Uh, and contracting was uh, done as, as quickly as it could. Uh, for these individual uh, anecdotal uh, events, I, I don't have any answers to them, uh, except to say there is a lot of misinformation coming out of, out of uh, uh, these Iraqi uh, companies. I'm not sure they could have done it for $80,000. I'm not a contractor. I'm not a uh, uh, well, this is what they maintain. Like that, I could, so your position is, and it's understandable, that faced with all the chaos, you turn to the companies with which the, the Army had contracts, Bechtel and Halliburton, and ask them to jump in immediately and do the work. Is that what happened, Mr. S uh, uh, General Strzok? Sir, I think, I think that's essentially correct, yes. Okay. You know, we, we went into a nation that had no power, no communications, no water, nothing. And we did not have the ability to even inform people of opportunities, much less that they would have the opportunity to, to mobilize their forces and come to work. See, so would, it's been very, very difficult. Yeah, I would submit that part of the problem is a, uh, a structural one. As long as we're hiring big government contracts on a cost-plus basis, these contractors have little incentive to reduce their costs. The more elaborate the project, the bigger they get paid, the more money they make. One example of that is the administration often points to Bechtel as an example of a contractor that is using local Iraqis as subcontractors. But although Bechtel's capital construction prime contract is currently at $920 million, Bechtel has said that as of October 1, only $54 million in subcontracts have been awarded to Iraqi firms. So that's 6 percent of this work is going to Iraqi firms. I think what we're doing, and I'd be interested in your response to that, is we're over-relying on large umbrella contracts with no opportunity for competition on task orders. We give a contract to Halliburton uh, uh, and their broad, what's called IDIQ, or indefinite delivery, uh, indefinite quantity contracts. That means that once the contract is awarded, the government can award task orders worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars without any competition. Isn't that the way it's done, General Strzok? It, essentially, I think that's correct, sir. The, the, uh, the reason we go to those kinds of contracts is due to the great uncertainty. We were not able to, to definitize the requirements and do in, incremental uh, competition for each of those task orders. So in a situation like this, we typically operate in an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity Well, in mode. the case of uh, oil infrastructure work in Iraq, uh, the Army gave Halliburton a sole source contract with no competition whatsoever. And uh, there's no other company that's allowed to compete, even though there are other corporations on the ground in Iraq that could do some of the work for less. The government task orders to Halliburton are not subject to any competition, and together they're now worth $1.39 billion. So what I would submit to you is that there are a lot of jobs that either Halliburton or Bechtel could do, but the way the situation is set up, they never submit competing bids. Instead, Halliburton has a monopoly on the oil work. Bechtel has a monopoly on the reconstruction work. It seems to me that we could either issue smaller contracts with competition or we could award larger multiple award contracts. That would mean that more than one company would be awarded a large umbrella contract and they could compete for individual task orders. That's the approach favored by OMB because it imposes greater price competition and results in savings for the taxpayers. Uh, now that we're moving away from the crisis of war contracting toward a more orderly and predictable process of reconstruction, shouldn't we think about moving away from these anti-competitive and IDIQ contracts, General Strzok? Sir, in fact, when we uh, determined that the, the, the most practical way and the appropriate way to uh, fix the oil infrastructure was go sole source, at that very moment we embarked on a competitive process to, to provide a follow-on contract. And, Within this month, we should see that competitive uh, contract for the oil industry being awarded. So we recognize that it's much better to go in an open and, and competitive way. But isn't I that going to give one contract for the north and one for the south without competition? Yeah. Yes, sir. 
W no, I'm sorry. No, not without it would be competed. No, it's, it's competed. But it for is. the one for the north, will as be I understand, it's one for the north and one for the south. Sir, I haven't been personally involved, but I think that's correct. So I think the the plan for the supplemental is that it will be full and open, and we will go to multiple contractors so we can mobilize a much greater uh, portion of our capability. And certainly, the performance measure on that will be their uh, plans and records for employing local Iraqi companies. Thank you. Uh, let me just, as I understand it, <clears throat> Halliburton's role in Iraq is based on its Brown and Root subsidiary. Uh, Brown and Root holds a very competitively awarded one. They had to compete with other country, uh, companies in the log cap contract, which provides a wide variety of logistic services to DOD overseas. I think it came out of Bosnia. But they were awarded that. It was competitively bid. You come into a new country. Uh, there is no economy that's out there working at this point. It's in shambles. And it sounds like some members would have liked you to go out to a competitive bid and waited six months before we can cap the oil fields and do those things. And obviously, you, you, you couldn't do that. So you yes, went sir. with a pre-awarded, uh, a pre-competitively bid contract that, in fact, was a legal scheme to do this. And now, as soon as we're up and running, we're going to go out and competitively bid uh, this area again. Is that basically it? Yes, sir. The, the, the log cap contract to which you referred was competitively bid and awarded to Brown and Root in December 2001. This is a contract that the Army keeps in place so when there is a contingency, the contractor can respond to provide logistics, dining facilities, and all the things that we need these days when we go on these contingencies. And other companies bid on that at yes, the time. Yes, sir, they did. And it was competitive. In fact, another company had it prior to them getting the contract in December 2001. So and these are kept in place with just the kind of contingencies that you mentioned, and, and so that's what we took to war. And w w uh, yeah, but let me just make one point. When we start talking about fees and costs, let's remember, you know, that we're working under rules and regulations. Only costs that are allocable, specifically al allocable under the FAR, the Federal Acquisition yes, Regulations, sir. are allowable. Yes, Other sir. costs and fees, and this is scrutinized by the Defense Contract Audit Agency. Uh, other fees, uh, and it has to be allowable and reasonable, only those are reimbursed. And it is not uncommon in these situations by the, you withhold final payment to go through the audits that there are unallowable un, uh, costs. That, that's, that, that is standard procedure. Uh, also, the fees in this area are not big fees when compared to what you would get in the private sector. It's, it's been my recollection, and I was a government contracts attorney for close to 20 years before I came here. And that, that's my understanding of the situation. Is that, is that fair? You know, turn on your microphone. Also, when you're in a, in a you need to turn your microphone. When, uh, when you are in a combat zone uh, and the contractor has to be indemnified and all those things, sometimes the costs go higher than they would if you of course. were just on a normal contingency. <laughs> I guess so. Of course. That's, what, that's the point. Yeah, I should, I should be happy to yield, Mr. Watson. I thank you. I, th I thought what you uh, pointed out in this questioning was, was helpful to understand how it operates. The point I'm trying to make is if you have one big contract without specified tasks, sometimes you can't specify them, but sometimes you can, no, no. there's no real competition for the task. So you give a, a contract, to, That's right. if you're going to do north and south, one competitive contract, they're competing for the monopoly. I would like to see, and I think OMB is recommending this, the Office of Managed Budget, if you can settle on some of the tasks, have price competition for those tasks, that can help us hold down the, the price on it, rather than give a monopoly to Bechtel uh, for one purpose and monopoly no. for Halliburton for the other, or divide up the country north-south <coughs> and let them compete for a monopoly let, for the north. Let me just recall my experience. I, I don't know what the right vehicle is. I'm not close enough to this and have examined it. And what Mr. Waxman says may, in fact, be true, but it may also be true that we're dealing with a foreign country where people there are, have their lives at risk and that you're not going to have a lot of companies move people over there on a contingency that they might get something. And so in that case, by doing larger contracts, you have the infrastructure up and operating. Uh, it's competitively bid originally. But if you compete each task, you may not get the same kind of commitment in economies of scale that you could get other. I don't know the answer. And I think what we're saying is let's look at this very carefully because obviously the more competition we get, uh, and the more that we're able to ar involve Iraqis in doing their own work, it's not only a kind of a nation-building exercise, it helps their economy uh, as well. I think that's, that's the point. I, I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, 
we need we need to look at this in some sure. some detail. Mr. But, Chairman, just one that last. I'd one be happy to just add on because I've not. I think we all want the same objective. Yes, sir. But my my concern is when you have uh, Halliburton as a sole source contract in, in to deal with the oil industry, and Bechtel has a sole source contract, uh, or, or not a sole source, but an exclusive contract to deal with reconstruction. They're just sitting there with monopolies. And that isn't going to produce the cost savings. We've got to figure out some way, if you'll forgive me as a Democrat, to, to lecture the Republicans on, we need some way to get competition and market forces where it's possible. There are times when it's not. That's why we have these, uh, these ongoing contracts. But right now, we put ourselves in a position where we have an ongoing contractual monopoly with two major corporations. And I don't think it's serving the taxpayers' oh. interest or the Iraqi reconstruction. Sir, sir, aren't there, aren't there over a dozen contractors? I mean, there are, there are dozens of contractors over there in Iraq. Am I right? There are, but in these particular sectors, it's Bechtel and the right. infrastructure and, and Halliburton and uh, KBR and the uh, oil. Sir, I, it's our job as a government agency to, with the technical cap capacity to uh, monitor how these funds are spent. We don't simply turn the contractor loose with a bag of money. He's got to come in. We write the statements of work. We ensure that cost, quality, and schedule are met, and we demand that only the necessary things are done. That's the, that's the responsibility of our agency. So the competition occurs up front, ideally, not so in the case of the KBR contract, and I think there are good reasons for not being competitive in that situation. But it's our responsibility to make sure that we get best value for the for the tax. Well, let's dollar. get to the nub of this thing. I mean, there are some people who don't like the contractors you chose because they've had affiliations with people that are in office. Uh, his senior senator's uh, a husband's company also received a large contract for work over there, uh, just to make this a, a bipartisan bashing, if you will. Uh, I, we haven't been complaining about that. We factually, I think, we have people making these decisions that aren't in the political loop at all. Uh, these are professional contracting agents and procurement officials who are doing their job. But what you need to understand is that there's a lot of scrutiny on this. Yes, and there sure. are just political ramifications and there are financial ramifications. And, and I think we, we just need to be aware of that. And so to the extent we can get competition, even on the smallest tasks, the extent we can involve Iraqis, we think that's a good thing. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. No, it's not a fair statement. And I take some exception to it because I, rather, I thought it was rather personal. I don't, have a, I don't think you ought to question my motivation, Mr. Chairman. I didn't. I am not uh, questioning the contract to Halliburton. You've only mentioned the, it 20 of the, times. Of the, of the administration and <laughs> Vice President Cheney. I'm questioning Halliburton contract because it was a sole source, no competition for it, contract. That is so, not accurate. Just a minute. They won it, Mr. It's, it's my time, Mr. Waxman, and they won this competitively in Bosnia. They beat other companies out for this. You had an emergency situation, and now it's being competed again. They have a, comp a no, they got a sole source contract to do the work in Iraq. There that was, was no KBR. Mr. Chairman, may I make a sentence? I know it's your time, but in your committee, but when you say that I'm motivated because of, I, of, I, of, of people being close to this administration, I want to make clear I'm motivated because I think the taxpayers are getting ripped off. If we have a contract where there was no competition for it, a cost plus basis to a company that has a record of overcharging the taxpayers of this country. And I'll be glad to put into the record uh, of this committee the, uh, the, the, the uh, background for that statement. And I would rather see that if we're going to have reconstruction in Iraq, we, we try to get co competition and not close out the Iraqi people, not close out other companies from competing for some of these tasks. And I say it with, no, with, and I don't think my motivation ought to be questioned. As I said, I think we all want the same goal. I'm afraid we're not achieving that goal. I've gone through instances where I believe we are overpaying, and, uh, and these contracts end up being gold-plated. And I, and I must say, General, the Army does not have a good record, when you look at Halliburton's history, of scrutinizing the contracts uh, that, that, where we've overpaid in the past. Uh, we want to work with you to do better. But it, by its nature, uh, I think we end up uh, well, uh, uh, hurting the taxpayers' best yeah. interest in some of these kinds. Yeah, and I, and I, let me just say this, just that I didn't pull this out of the air. There have been numerous statements uh, from my, my friend and others in point of fact linking Halliburton to administration officials in the same sentences, in the same press releases, maybe not today. So let, let's understand that there is, are political ramifications, and it's important that they understand this, Mr. Waxman, because as they make decisions at the administration level, they should be more sensitive 
to those kinds of things and ask for, for more competition. And that's something we both agree on. That's one of the reasons why I thought this administration would have been more sensitive because of the connection of the Vice President. Well, Mr. Waxman, reclaiming uh, my time, I think what we need to. Uh, sole source contract, no competition on a cost. Well, the fact, of the, the fact of the matter is that's not what happened. The fact of the matter is, and let me just restate this because I think it's important everybody understood it. Halliburton's role was based on its Brown Root subsidiary, and they won a competitively awarded contract under the previous administration in Bosnia uh, called LogCap to provide a wide variety of logistical services to DOD overseas. A task order under that contracting vehicle was used to perform the contingency planning for extinguishing oil fires to assess the damage to oil fields. Through LogCap, Brown and Root pre-position people and equipment to be able to provide emergency response relating to the Iraq oil system, as well as other needs and services outlined <laughs> under this contract. As we've heard today, we're now going forward and are going to recompete once we've had this up and stabilized. But there was, there was nothing there otherwise. We had to move in quickly. Uh, that, that's Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Waxman you've had your time. In Iraq. Could, uh, if Mr. I could just Mr. Brownlee. quickly make three points, sir. Mm -hmm. One, the log cap contract was, as you stated, competed. Two, there was a subsequent contract but they were to restore Iraqi oil. That is being recompeted, Correct. as General Strzok said, as we speak. The third point I would say is what normally drives us toward these different kinds of contracts is the degrees of certainty and uncertainty and the degrees of urgency. And sometimes that costs more. Thank you very much. Let me, let me uh, just, uh, well, that was my first one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I think we have another panel waiting, and uh, we have a couple other questions. If we can be very quick, let's try to do maybe a question uh, side, and we'll start uh, over on your side, Mr. Th Wax. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. On another subject, if I might, uh, Mr. Dibble, I recently received a letter from the Department of State regarding Iraq that I found confusing. Uh, I believe the subject is relevant to the work of your Bureau, and I'm hoping you may be able to provide some clarity on the matter. The letter was dated September 25th. It was a response to a letter uh, of July 21 I sent to the State Department regarding its December 19, 2002 fact sheet entitled, quote, Illustrative Examples of Omissions from the Iraqi Declaration to the United States Security Council, end quote. This fact sheet listed eight key areas where the Bush administration found fault with Iraq's December 7, 2002 weapons declaration. And under the heading Nuclear Weapons, the fact sheet stated, quote, the declaration ignores efforts to purchase uranium from Niger. Why is the Iraqi regime hiding their uranium procurement? Now, since the issuance of that fact sheet, it's become known uh, that by the time of the December 19th fact sheet itself, intelligence analysts at the State Department's own Bureau of Intelligence and Research and at the CIA had already rejected evidence that Iraq was attempting to procure uranium from Niger. So I asked the statement and explained how this statement could have ended up in the December 19th fact sheet and who was responsible for creating the fact sheet. The State Department responded to me that, quote, the Public Affairs Bureau prepared the fact sheet based on information obtained from other bureaus of the State Department, end quote. The letter didn't specify which bureaus provided the information. So my first question to you is about the creation of this December 19th fact sheet. You're the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Department's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Did the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs participate in the creation or review of the fact sheet? Mr. Waxman, I was not there, but I will assert for the record that I'm sure we, I'm sure we were, yes. Uh, what would have been the nature of the Bureau's participation? I would assume that it would have been some sort of coordinating role. Would the Bureau have provided, would have provided information or recommendations regarding the language about Iraq seeking uranium in, in Niger? And if so, could you describe the information or recommendations the Bureau Probably provided? not. Probably not. No. Why not? Um, I don't know the source of that, the information, how the information that found its way into the report or the, the fact sheet was sourced. Mm -hmm. um, I would expect, however, that it would have come either from the intelligence community or from another bureau in the State Department, for example, the Nonproliferation Bureau. Who, who, uh, could you describe what else you know about who would have participated in the creation of that December 19th fact sheet? I know very little. Um, I would speculate that it was a broad um, department-wide effort led perhaps by the Bureau of Public Affairs but with input from many other bureaus in the department. Uh, 
The State Department's September 25, 2003 response also asserted that, quote, both the NSC staff and the CIA were consulted on the fact sheet. But we know from CIA Director Tenet's statement that the CIA had discredited the Niger evidence before the issuance of the December 19 fact sheet. Further, according to a June 13, 2003 Washington Post article, CIA officials denied a role in creating the fact sheet, stating that the CIA raised an objection to the Niger claim, but it came too late to prevent its publication. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Dibble, whether you can shed any light on this issue. Uh, could you describe what you know about whether the CIA was consulted about the fact sheet, when such consultation occurred, and the input the CIA provided with respect to the Niger statement? Again, I cannot, I cannot uh, speak from personal knowledge. Um, so I cannot say when or exactly what input was provided. I can only speculate on the basis of experience that when such products are put together, the CIA and others who may have relevant information are consulted. What's a mystery to me is that um, you, you said it might have been the Bureau of, of Nuclear Nonproliferation, which would have been Secretary Bolton. They deny that they had any role in this. Then you indicated it might have been INR, but you say INR wouldn't have had anything to do with it. So I'm trying to figure out who had something to do with this. At this it's stage. a fair question. I certainly take it back. Um, I'm speculating myself at this point. Per perhaps you could uh, uh, help us and get some answers for the record I'll from my best. your colleagues at the State Department. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think that's really outside your scope, isn't it, of where you generally deal with, but your agencies. Uh, Response. Ms. Norton, you've been sitting there patiently. We're going to, we, I think we can wrap with you and uh, wrap it up at this and let the panel go. I, th I, th I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm overdue to give a presentation, so I particularly appreciate your uh, consideration. I wanted two questions. Uh, uh, one involves a dilemma I'm sure you face. Again, this, this comes from reports uh, that, of course, we don't want to do poli uh, policy uh, with contracting with former members of the Bath policy, uh, Bath Party. Um, according to some uh, reports, though, in, in the press, some of the Iraqis say that they, they, they didn't know about that. And when informed about that, and here, this is a quote, and I wonder what your reaction to this and how you deal with the dilemma. I can't believe that. Saddam was here for 35 years, and to work you had to have contracts with the government. It was, of course, a government-run country. Otherwise, it was impossible. So why should we be punished? How do you deal with uh, the fact that almost anybody who did business had to do business with this government? That that may have meant like that, like people joined the Communist Party. That okay, I got I got my card, and, and, and these may be among the most experienced contractors, and yet we don't want to have anything to do with real rogues from the Bath Party. What is your policy, and how do you ferret that out? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> it, it certainly is a dilemma, and, and so many of the Iraqi people were members of the Ba'ath Party, many f for simple survival, as you pointed out, because you got ed access to education and other benefits. We And the debathification uh, order that Ambassador Bremer issued, he really looked at the upper levels of the Ba'ath Party, those committed members of the Ba'ath Party that, that competed for uh, uh, increased positions in the party. And so we try to make a, dis a distinction between those. The debathification order was very rigid in its application, but it does leave room for uh, reconsideration of those people who can clearly demonstrate that they were members of the party uh, strictly for convenience and for survival. You'll find that particularly true in the academic world where you could not hold a professorship if you were not a party member. The, uh, it, with, it is with, a dilemma, though. With contracting, yes. could you have a contract with the government without being a member of the Bath Party? I don't know the answer to that, ma'am. That's something we need to find out. Uh, I, I, Mr. Secretary, do you know that? No, ma'am, I don't. But it's a good question. I'll be happy to take it for the record. Thank you very much. Now, we should get back to the chairman on that. One more question. Um, okay. Again, these are reports that are coming up that uh, we know corruption is rampant. We've done lots in our country because we got corruption here, too. But we've got all kinds of re rules and regulations. and. Uh, disqualification if we find out what you've been doing. Um, again, reports that uh, um, companies demand kickbacks. Um, 
And uh, here is a quote uh, that I'd like clarification on. Uh, the claim that when American companies hire Iraqi firms as major contractors, the Iraqi companies then demand a kickback called the commission from smaller firms in exchange for a piece of the job. What do you know about commissions? What can you tell us about commissions? It may have been the way the practice for doing business before, are commissions part of the way in which Iraqi firms, subcontractors believe they have to do business today? And what are you doing about it if it is? Ma'am, there, I heard some peripheral discussions about a process used under the Saddam regime of a 10 percent commission that was uh, paid to, um, uh, to a government official for the issuance of a contract, and that money sort of disappeared and went into accounts. And, but there, there's a name for it. I don't recall the name, but it was a common practice apparently under the old regime. So what, what do you do about it? Now, now you're faced with a culture that said you had to pay a kickback called a commission. What, what does the provisional authority do about it? What does the provisional government uh, in place do about it? Are there, is it possible to issue regulations? How do you change the culture if you just accept that that was the way the business was done under Saddam? Well, I think we, we don't work that way, and we simply make that clear to the Iraqis. Yeah, that these that's are subcontractors who, who yes, listen, you don't work that way, of course. But we're saying, what are you doing about the fact that it was a part of the culture to demand a commission from a subcontractor. What are you doing about that practice? Well, as I said, I'm not sure the practice currently exists, but well, that's uh, part of it's the certainly problem. something in, in our Mr. role. Mr. Secretary, yeah. now, you know, I, I can't, ex I, I, I can't expe expect the, the general to, to, to know everything. This is a policy matter. I understand. Uh, and obviously, you've got a provisional government in place that's trying to deal with these pre-Saddam or these Saddam practices. Yes, very serious, very serious practice if we are allowing this to be built into the way we do business too because we don't see no evil, see no evil and do no evil. What can you tell us you, you can do about the apparent culture of kickbacks that was a part of the way subcontractors had to do business with contractors, Iraqi contractors, uh, under Saddam? Well, I, I can tell you, of course, that as General Strzok would, was going to tell you, that that is not a part of our process. And if if we were aware of it, then then we would do what we could to eliminate it. I will look into it. Uh, I was not aware of it. Uh, the kind of kickbacks that you talk about would be considered crime in this country, and I hope would be considered crime in their country under their new democracy. And I, uh, could I ask that you one look up, into so it? I'm sorry. Could I ask, one, that you look into it? I will. I'll be happy uh, and, to. And two, uh, would you, because this is very difficult to deal with. We found it difficult yes, to deal with in this country. And then in this country, when we're giving contracts to other countries who have such corrupt practices, it even gets worse. But this is different. Yes, we are remaking this country. We are, re -do we are helping them uh, to do it the way we think it ought to be done. And I think most of them would no. believe it ought to be done. So I would like to know from you what it is that you think you can do to halt this practice if you find that there is such a practice. And I wish you'd give that information to the chair yes, of the commission as a result well, of this. I, I thank, I'm, thank the I lady. May, Madam, uh, Did you want to make a could, response? Yep, just a yeah. quick point, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, we are in the process now, as, as Mr. Corlogas can tell you, of standing up a government, standing up a legal system, standing up a ju justice system. And what you're describing, as I indicated to you, would be considered criminal in our country. It still happens on occasion, and we prosecute it. So we will do everything we can to eliminate it from the system as we know it, as we are administering it now, and, and also insist that I'm sure that it will be a part of their legal system, and they'll have to deal with it also. Thank but you. As far as we're doing now, I'll, I'll do what I can to look into it and see how, if that kind of practice is, is existing now as it used to. Okay. Mr. Freeland Heisen, and then we'll go to Ms. Maloney and we'll close with me and we'll get to the next panel. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm Rodney Freeling Heisen. I uh, serve on the Defense uh, Subcommittee on Appropriations and uh, was part of a group of 17 members of Congress who recently returned from Iraq and had, I think, a very positive experience. And, and let me say, Mr. Chairman, uh, I am most impressed by Ambassador Bremer and his team working in some very difficult circumstances. He's put together a, a first-class team, 
and uh, they are doing so much to support the Iraqi people to be free. They are free, but with 100,000 criminals let out by Saddam Hussein just before he uh, hid himself, uh, th those people, as well as Ba'athites and Saddam supporters and terrorists coming in over the borders from Syria, Iran, and probably from Saudi Arabia, uh, it it's remarkable what uh, the Bremer team has done to establish security and uh, provide the Iraqi people with uh, uh, the means uh, for them to develop themselves back into a first-rate economic, freedom-loving powerhouse uh, in the Middle East. And let me pay tribute. Uh, it is truly an inspiration to see, uh, have met, and all politics is local with some of my uh, New Jersey Army men and women on the ground. It, it is a damn shame that a lot of the good work that they're doing there is not being reported. As it was described to me, after the 1,000 embedded reporters left, they sort of left the third stream of the press corps there. And most of those people filed their reports from the Al Shaid Hotel, and, and they're not reporting on what the co coalition provisional authority are doing and what a lot of uh, brave Iraqi uh, leaders are doing, men and women, in uh, provincial capitals and cities throughout Iraq. Yes, the Sunni Triangle is a, is a dangerous place for any soldier or civilian that's helping the country to operate, but I was most impressed by General Ray Odierno, who actually is a New Jersey native and is on the ground uh, leading uh, in, in a major way reconstructing the lives of the Iraqi people who have lived under incredible oppression for 35 years. It was said to me, and I think it's an interesting fact, Mr. Chairman, that 70 percent of the population in Iraq today has known no other leader than Saddam Hussein. So we, we've got a long way to go to tell them uh, uh, and show them the road to democracy. And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to enter into the record some more formal, perhaps less uh, strong comments, but certainly cogent comments into the record uh, it, with your permission. We'll note for the record that you said different reporters are now there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and we also thank the gentleman for being here and thank him for going to Iraq. Uh, at this time, the chair will um, recognize Ms. Maloney. She has the floor for five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, too, had the opportunity to go to Iraq. Uh, progress is being made. There are still some security problems, challenges. But as one uh, New York soldier said to me, we're fighting for the greatest gift of all, freedom. And I am hopeful we'll be able to achieve it. I respectfully request that my five prior questions be responded to in writing. And I'd like to build, and I'll get them to you this afternoon, I'd like to build on the questioning of others. There's been a lot of talk about transparency in contracts. And I think that certainly before we vote on the $87 billion, we should have that transparency, not only in rhetoric, but in the reality of numbers and information. I was impressed in Iraq how the generals in great detail could show you how they're spending their money, what they're doing, and where they're going. Yet when we ask for information on taxpayer dollars going there, we're not getting the answers. And I think that, that, that members of Congress should be able to get detailed contract information on the process by which contracts are being awarded, the scope of specific contract terms, the details of task orders, and the payments that are being made to prime contractors. They have said in the press, they have said in this panel, they're not getting that information. And that is not fair to the people they represent, uh, that they face a vote on uh, $87 billion without having received that information. I likewise would like to request an accounting of all the confiscated money that our people um, retrieved from Saddam Hussein. I truly believe it would be a positive story if other generals are following the Petraeus model of creatively hiring Iraqi people to rebuild their own country. 
Um, I request that. I have asked for it several times. Again, we should have that information before we face a vote. And again, I, I uh, am concerned about how decisions are made in the supplemental budget request. Uh, when I have a document uh, from the CPA or in the Army Corps of Engineers and the Iraqi Oil Ministry that says that it would take $1.1 billion to restore oil to the pre-war levels of 3 million barrels a day. The supplemental asks for twice that. And when you combine it with what we've already spent, then it's three times what the uh, Army Corps of Engineers in their plan, the agency that was tasked to come forward with what it would cost. And, and I'm concerned about this. How did you come up with your numbers? If you're not even listening to the agency who is tasked to come up with the numbers, then, uh, then I'm, I'm concerned. And, and I know, General Strzok, that uh, you're with the Army Corps of Engineers, and possibly you were consulted. Uh, but as I said, uh, my staff met earlier with the Central Army Corps of Engineers here in Washington, and they said they were never consulted or talked to. Then why is the number twice now, three times, uh, what they projected? I could perhaps, quick could perhaps quickly respond, and we will provide a more uh, thorough response in writing. Ma'am, a big part of the additional supplemental was $900 million for the import of fuels uh, that we did not anticipate we would need. But we have not been able to get the refinery system up uh, to, pr to provide those fuels to, for the uh, internal consumption in Iraq. So that is a big portion of that. The other part, about $575 million of the supplemental, is for uh, requirements outside of the Corps of Engineers and Minister of Oil work plan that was submitted in July. So those are longer range uh, and yet very important elements. It is the development of the oil fields you mentioned, and it is also the uh, building of a new refinery things that we, we know we need to get started on now to uh, put the infrastructure in a, in a position where it can truly support the needs of the nation. The rest, about $500 million of the supplemental, really has to deal with uh, elements of the work plan that require more investment. Much of that has to do with security, the creative creation of rapid response teams to go in once uh, the infrastructure is hit to, to reduce the impact of the sabotage by rapidly returning it to service. So I, th I think there is a fairly detailed accounting of that in the CPA request that, that shows those elements which do aggregate to uh, a good sum of money, but there is a good reason for each of those. And in fact, we were, we were consulted uh, throughout the development of this, uh, this budget request. Well, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Central said they were not. And as I said, there were several um, items that appeared not to be involved in reconstruction. I mentioned them earlier. I'll, I'll place them in writing. But my, my final question, will we get transparency before the vote? Will we get an accounting of the contracts? Senators and members of this panel um, and others have said they request the information and it's not given to them. And I, I feel that uh, transparency means facts and figures and documents, not a statement. We're transparent. And uh, you have a tremendous challenge ahead of you. I would say peace in the whole region if, if we're successful in bringing a democracy there. Uh, but, but it has to be well managed or you don't have the faith of the American people and you don't have the faith of the Iraqi people. And, and it begins with, with documentation and management. And so far we haven't gotten that. Thank the gentlelady. I'm going to recognize myself and then we're going to let, you go, uh, let this panel get on its way. First, I, I want to say that um, I think you realize that we could almost just ask one of you the questions. Uh, we have such a fine group of, of individuals there that I apologize if we haven't utilized all your expertise. I think, Mr. Couric, um, I could just spend a day trying to understand what you encountered. I would like to have you give me a perspective because I believe that you found yourself interacting with a lot of Iraqis. And I want you to know if you feel the comment that was made to me way back in April by Mohammed Abdul Hassan in Umkasa was, was uh, still a, a problem today, and that was you don't know us and we don't know you. One, do you think they're getting to know us? Do you think they're getting to know us in a right way? This is the Iraqis. And two, are we getting to know them? Is there interaction or are we finding ourselves in the palaces having to do our work uh, not able to interact in a way that would be helpful. 
Um, maybe you could respond to that. I, I can speak from the perspective of dealing with the police, dealing with customs and borders, and, uh, and a lot dealing in the local communities in, in, uh, in and throughout Baghdad. Uh, I travel throughout Baghdad on a daily basis. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you listen to the press and they, they talk about lawlessness and looting and, and uh, chaos in the streets, uh, I'm proud to say that for my last probably 30 days, I just about ate out uh, dinner every night uh, in Baghdad at a restaurant, at a hotel. Uh, you know, the, the shops are open, the markets are open, and it's, it's not really what I've, I've read about and what I've seen since I've been back. Um, do we know them and do they know us? Uh, we're getting to know them better. They're getting to know us much better. Uh, in, in dealing with the police, I think initially uh, they were skeptical. Uh, I think um, history uh, between us, uh, you know, they thought initially we were going to come in and uh, we would leave. Uh, I think as time has gone on, uh, they have begun to trust us. They have learned to trust us. Um, and and we've, I've seen that with the police, but I've also seen it a lot with the Iraqi people. And, and that has helped us when it comes to information to fight the Fedayeen and the Ba'ath Party. Um, you know, initially, no one would come forward with information concerning terrorism, concerning attacks, concerning weapons. Uh, as time has gone on, and then we saw a major surge in information flow after the two sons of Saddam were killed. Uh, and for every day that Saddam doesn't pop his head out of the ground and take over the country, that, inform that information flow, flow is growing, and it's growing by the people in Iraq, and it's growing in internally in the police. Uh, the police today overwhelmingly uh, want to bring back a new country. They are working extremely hard. Um, the, the police in Baghdad are working on retraining uh, their, own, their own people. Um, they are extremely happy with their new equipment, with their new weapons. Uh, as you know, we had a, a difficult time initially uh, getting uniforms, getting weapons. You know, when we talk about contracts and contractors, uh, we used as many Iraqis as possible, but initially we just couldn't get a lot of this stuff in Iraq uh, with the local vendors. So we had to go where we had to go to get it done and get it done quick. Um, and, and it's moving along, and it's moving along at much better at a much faster rate than anyone would imagine. And as I said earlier, think, think this way. In four months, we went from zero precincts or zero stations in Baghdad to 35. There is no way you could have done that anywhere in this entire country in four months. It just couldn't happen. We stood up 35 police stations, 400 cars, 3,000 radios, uh, and I can go on and on, um, but that's as a result of this relationship. And I, and I will share with you one last thing. This is a comment uh, that was made, and I, it, it's rather frustrating to sit here and, and listen to a lot of the, a lot of the criticism based on, based on press and media reports. I will share with you a comment that was made to me by the Senior Deputy Minister of Interior just a few days ago. He asked me, I told him I was going to see the President on Friday, and he said, please tell the President to stop the complaining. The people in the United States have to stop complaining. The politicians have to stop complaining. You are making friends of our enemies. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, the Fedayeen and the Ba'athist, today they can watch television. They have satellite dishes. They can see things today they've never seen before. They see that criticism. They hear it. In their mind, they're winning. In their mind, them attacking our people, them attacking the police, them attacking the coalition, they are winning. They're doing a good job. That criticism is hurting us. I just want to say in the end, you said they are winning. That's what they think. That's what they think. Based on what they see. Based on what they see. Here. And I think it's hurting us. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to ask you, General, um, if you feel um, that our troops are getting the opportunity to interact with Iraqis or are they having to be very distant, and I want to also ask you, I had so many Iraqis tell me uh, that they did not like seeing Americans killed and it hurt them, but they said, why can't we stand guard over a hospital? Why does it have to be an American? I mean, what skill would 
prevent them from having that opportunity. So if you could speak to both issues, the interaction of our troops and the, and the guarding of places like hospitals and so on. Sir, perhaps the Secretary could talk more about the interaction of troops. Most of my attention was as a member of CPA, and I was not out on the streets with the troops a lot. But I, I, as I did have occasion, I thought it was a, 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 a developing relationship and one that I think is, is the, the, our troops are forming a bond with the Iraqi people. They know why they're there, and they're serving the Iraqi people just like they're serving our people. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, trying to transfer a th the responsibility for security of places like hospitals to the Iraqis by facilities protection services, by the police forces. So that, that is an ongoing effort of ours to relieve our troops from that responsibility. So that is very much happening. And, Mr. Secretary, perhaps you'd like to comment. I know yeah, you spent a lot of time uh, with soldiers out there. Sir, and, and, and my experience, of course, is based on my visits there on two occasions and talking to all the soldiers that I could and their commanders. And uh, some of the frustrations that they mention are that uh, they do have uh, contact with the Iraqi people and there may be an incident and they're out there with the Iraqi people and there may be 35 or 40 Iraqis coming and trying to help them and pointing out a areas where something might have happened or might happen. And But the press reports will that they will go find one disgruntled Iraqi and that turns out to be the story. And our soldiers are even frustrated by that. But, but they do have contact with them. They're out in the streets on a daily basis, uh, running patrols and doing the security things that they do. And uh, hopefully it'll continue to grow and get, get even uh, better. Before we uh, end this panel, is there any comment that any of you want to put on the record uh, before we get to our next panel? And may I say parenthetically that the chairman of this committee is on the floor of the House now and wanted me to let you know that's why he's not here right now. I was just going to add to that, yes. sir. You talked about uh, turning things over to the Iraqis. And of course, all of our division commanders are busily helping to train the Iraqis, as I indicated, police and Civil Defense Corps members primarily, sometimes assisting in training the border guards and others. But uh, we've trained about 56,000. There's about another 14,000 in the pipeline. And I think all of us see that as the way the United States does begin to draw down its troop strength there is to replace it with Iraqis. Thank you. Thank I, you I, I'd conclude by just saying to you that I've known Ambassador Bremer the entire time I've been in Congress. And I am very proud of the work that he and his people are doing, very proud of what our military is doing. And, very grateful, Tom, uh, that you're there to help him. He's uh, blessed to have you help him. You have a difficult job, and uh, we thank you. And I, I, I am absolutely certain Republicans and Democrats alike uh, share that, uh, that uh, sense of gratitude to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get to our next panel. Uh, we have Mr. Ala Hadari. He's an Iraqi American uh, from the Chairman's uh, District. Dr. Lamia. Alarith, Iraqi American from the Chairman's District as well, and Mr. Miss Biada, Biada, I'm sorry, Serrata from um, Gordon, from uh, the great district in Manhattan uh, of uh, Congressman uh, Woman Maloney. She's our constitutional scholar. I believe uh, we will have one who will be a translation. Correct. He will be there too. Uh, okay. Okay. He will speak in English. Okay. Now I need to swear them in. Correct. I'm going to ask you to stand because uh, we're going to swear you in, and we'll need the translator if uh, you're going to be speaking to be sworn in as well. Okay. Okay. Hold. On. Let's get our order here. Yeah, we're we'll gonna we'll get change the order. Just make sure that. Hold on one sec. You just maybe need to. Yeah, there we go. Okay. If you would raise your right hand, do you prompt, uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this uh, before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We'll note for the record our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. It's an honor to have you here. I have been looking forward to this panel. 
And um, we will start uh, with Mr. Allah Hadari. Uh, you will start with your testimony, sir. And, uh, make sure the mic is on. Would you? Is it on? If you would move it up, please. Giving me this opportunity to speak to you about the situation in Iraq. First of all, reading Iraq of Saddam Hussein and his regime was the best thing the U.S. could do for Iraqi people. Regardless of controversy about how Saddam was removed from power. Secondly, this administration is putting forth a tremendous effort in rebuilding Iraq and establishing a normal life for the Iraqi people. But in spite of this huge effort, we still have a difficult road ahead of us because we don't have a clear and comprehensive plan. Mr. Chairman, allow me to point out a few issues which will help us establish strong ties with Iraqi people and can be accomplished in a six-month period. First, the current governing council this council does, does not reflect the Iraqi population. Also, does not have representative for many Iraqi provinces, provinces which have more than one million people in each of them. One million people. So we need to revise and enhance this current council structure. Second, disbanding of Iraqi army. We must accept the fact that disbanding the Iraqi army and police forces was a huge mistake. These forces played a vital part in keeping law and order. Most of the soldiers and policemen were against Saddam Hussein. Bringing them, bring them, bringing them back will allow the U.S. military to move the pieces out of, outside of the cities, and this will keep U.S. soldiers out of harm's way. Third, the economy situation. The, the Iraqi economy situation is a truck button. Power, drinking water, health care, infrastructure, almost everything has been destroyed. And there are millions of unemployed Iraqis. So re reconstruction and economic, economic revival must be top priorities. I think it is necessary for the U.S. to initiate a Marshall Plan style program with a fund of $100 billion over the next four years. Much of this money should be financed by neighboring oil produced states such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and the Emirates. I am surprised that this has not happened yet. Also, we must encourage investment by American business through cooperation with OPEC and Inter in Import Export Bank. Fourth, ministry employee. Qualified Iraqi people are capable of managing their own affairs. And 
we should let them do so. They are more knowledgeable than anyone else in their affairs of their own country. Ex-employees of Iraqi ministries should definitely be rehired and the U.S. administration can oversee their work, their work. Fifth, local government. Each of 18 provinces must choose a governor and governing council. This will build confidence and a better relationship between the U.S. administration and different groups in Iraq. It will also relieve some of the burden of the U.S. administration in Baghdad. Mr. Chairman, in summary, there are five things that must be done in Iraq. Number one, revise and enhance the governing council. Number two, rehire the Iraqi soldiers and policemen who were not part of the Saddam regime. Number three, bring back Iraqi employees of the ministries, except those who were loyal to Saddam Hussein. Number four, organize the administration of all 18 Iraqi provinces. Number five, the last, revive the Iraqi economy with a Marshall-style plan by using money for neighbor, neighboring oil-producing states for Iraq. These countries have the money, and it is for their well-being and for the stability of the region. Thank you very much for the time, and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, witness will uh, be introduced by her, uh, her representative. Thank, thank you so much. And I, I want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Davis and you, um, Acting Chairman Shays, for including uh, in our panel uh, one of the uh, most extraordinary uh, women, I would say, in the world, although she's often unrecognized, Beate uh, Gordon. And her, her story is groundbreaking and, and important because she single-handedly created civil rights for Japanese women. And I hope that we will be able to create civil rights for the Iraqi women and the Afghani women. She was born in Vienna, grew up in Tokyo, and became fluent in the Japanese language. Just before World War II, she came to America to attend Mills College. Because of her fluency in Japanese, she was hired by the Foreign Broadcast Intelligence Service during the war to listen to and interpret radio broadcasts from Japan. At that time, she was one of 66 Caucasians who could speak Japanese. And this is a theme that you raised, Mr. Chairman, many times in Iraq, that we need more people who speak Arabic, uh, not only here in the United States, but in Iraq, uh, working with the Iraqi people and with our, our people there. She became the American counterpart to the notorious Tokyo Rose, writing radio scripts uh, each day. Following the, the war, she returned to Japan and worked for the Supreme Commander, General MacArthur. She became one of the drafters of the 1947 Japanese Constitution, the only woman at the table. And she wrote a book about her experiences. Uh, she was assigned to draft the section of the Constitution relating to women's rights. At the time, Japanese women had no say in marriage, divorce, education, property, or inheritance rights. The provisions she drafted gave Japanese women fundamental constitutional rights that literally changed their lives and the society. She ultimately worked for the Japan Society and the Asian Society in New York, and I believe that her presence today, she will have very important insights because of her experience in Japan. She originally drafted 25 provisions guaranteeing civil and social welfare rights for women. Only one of these provisions made it into the Constitution. And she was told that the rest would be adopted by the government, the bureaucrats. Fifty years later, 
not one of her other provisions made it into law. So her experience shows that if women's rights are not expressly spelled out in the Constitution now, the civil authority in Iraq cannot be counted on to adopt these rights later in legislation. So I thank her for the role that she played in guaranteeing rights for women in Japan, and I earnestly hope uh, that uh, the drafters will be as successful as she was as they draft the new Constitution for human rights uh, for all people in, in Iraq. Thank you for your life service, Ms. Gordon. That was a lovely introduction, and I, my only regret is that the chairman was not here to introduce or is not here to introduce mm -hmm. our two other witnesses. Um, a lovely introduction, wonderful to have you here, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Representative Maloney, for your wonderful words. Ms. Gordon. It's not on? No. Just tap the end of it. Let's see if it's on. Just tap the end. Do this. I think it is on. Actually, it's probably not close. Let's see. Tap the top of it, Ms. Gordon. Just I'm do this. I'm not very good with machines. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. Tap it on again. Put it on again. Can you help me? Yes, you can. It's funny. We have, we have more problems with people seeing the light on this mic. Ah. Okay. Thank you so much, Representative Maloney, for your really very kind words. I appreciate them. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I'm honored to have been invited to talk to you about my work as the drafter of the women's rights article of the Japanese Constitution and how that might apply to Iraq. In the last four years, I have testified about these rights in both houses of the Japanese diet. Since Japanese women had no rights at all under the Constitution before World War II, I drafted 25 separate provisions. Only one survived, as Representative Maloney said, and I will read that to you now. Marriage shall be based only on the mutual consent of both sexes, and it shall be maintained through mutual cooperation with the equal rights of husband and wife as a basis with regard to choice of spouse, property rights, inheritance, choice of domicile, divorce, and other matters pertaining to marriage and the family. Laws shall be created from the standpoint of individual dignity and the essential equality of the sexes. I also collaborated on Article 14, which in part reads, all the people are equal under the law, and there shall be no discrimination in political, economic, or social relations because of race, creed, sex, social status, or family origin. In 1946, I was working for the government section of General MacArthur's GHQ in Tokyo. On February 4th, 1946, General Whitney called about 20 of his staff members for a top secret meeting. He said, you are now a constitutional assembly and by order of General MacArthur, you will draft the new constitution of Japan. He also said that the task had to be accomplished in seven days. I was in the political affairs division which was ordered to write the chapter on civil rights. My division chief assigned the article of women's rights to me because I was a woman. I immediately researched many of the world's then existing constitutions and compiled detailed women's rights articles, including specific social welfare rights for women and children. When I presented my draft to the chief of the steering committee, Colonel Cadiz, he said, Beate, you have given the women more rights than are in the US Constitution. I replied, that's not difficult, since the US Constitution does not even mention the word woman. Eventually, the social welfare rights in my draft were eliminated, because the steering committee felt that they were not appropriate for a constitution, but belonged in the civil code. 
I argued that the Japanese bureaucrats would never write such laws into the civil code. Colonel Cady said, don't worry, we will be here for a long time and we will see to it that they get in. Unfortunately, this did not turn out to be so. 56 years after the Constitution was promulgated, social welfare rights for women have not entered the Japanese Civil Code. When I lecture in Japan, I'm always told, if only your social welfare rights had been in the Constitution, how much struggling we would have avoided. It took one and a half years between the drafting of the Constitution and its adoption. Now, Japanese women are exercising the constitutional rights they received as a result of American participation in preparing the post-war constitution. Japanese women participate in central and local governments as legislative representatives, mayors, and governors. Women have held positions as Speaker of the House, Chairman of a political party, Supreme Court Justice. Women are also prominent in the media as reporters, talk show hosts, documentary filmmakers, and editors. Women practice law. One woman is even the CEO of the largest publishing firm in Japan. But the one field where Japanese women have not made enough progress is in the corporate world, but they are trying very hard. Although conditions in Iraq, in Iraq are quite different from the conditions in Japan in 1946, certain lessons can be learned. Women who have been suppressed all over the world for many centuries must be made equal with men in any real democracy. Women everywhere are peace-loving, interested in social issues, in education for their children, and in living a useful life. Women all over the world are demanding equality. I think that Japanese women who have gone through the miseries of war, the deprivation of housing and food, the reconstruction of devastated cities, and the institution of a new constitution are in a unique position to serve as models and advisors to the women in Iraq. I am sure they, they will urge the women of Iraq to make sure that their new constitutions include not only fundamental rights, but also social welfare rights. May the United States help them in this noble cause as it did so successfully in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. As I look at you, I think you must be an imposter to tell me that somehow you were involved in legislation in the 1940s. Ms. Alarif, Dr. Alarif, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I guess good afternoon now. Uh, I'll read my summary in the interest of brevity. I wish to thank the Office of Congressman Davis for giving me the opportunity to appear before this uh, distinguished committee to share some of the observations and reflections on the events of post-war Iraq from the perspective of an American who was born in Iraq. The mere fact that I'm appearing before you in this public forum is a sign of a significant accomplishment directly resulting from the fall of Saddam Hussein. Prior to this time, I would have had serious concerns for the safety of my family had I taken such a public position on any matter relating to Iraq. Uh, many questions were posed by uh, Congressman Maloney and by uh, Congressman Shea on some uh, things that are happening in Iraq or some questions. I hope throughout my uh, soliloquy now, some of them might be answered. Therefore, uh, I hope you will forgive me for diverting the conversation into a little bit more of a historical perspective of the social and uh, forces that have shaped the political destiny of Iraq, and they continue to do so. These are contradictory religious, ethnic, and social factors, which can be grouped into four groups. One we're all very familiar with is the religious and ethnic diversities. The second is the traditional tribal conservative 
value system. This has played and continues to play a very divisive influence on Iraqi uh, politics. The third is the ever-growing middle class, which was the unifying factor among all these political uh, factions. And finally, there is the working classes. Combination of the various wars that were initiated by Saddam and the crippling effects of the embargo effectively gave Saddam uh, Hussein a free hand in eliminating any and all opposition uh, to his party and his politics. Therefore, the Iraqi people could not overthrow him and needed the help of outside power like the U.S. and its allies. My humble observations as to the situation in Iraq um, are in winning the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people are as follows. I agree with my esteemed colleague here and several of the members of the administration that the reconstitution of the Iraqi army should reduce the need for more American troops. The use of the reconstituted Iraqi military can serve multiple purposes. One is to relieve the CPA troops from various security details. Three, uh, two is to have additional military support without having to ask other countries for it. And uh, three is to put the, uh, an Iraqi face on uh, the various operations among the civilian population. And four is to provide some gainful employment for those soldiers who've been laid off. And I would say it would be anyone below the rank of a major, it would be the lower ranking officer. In while we're talking about winning the hearts and minds, wherever possible, alternative methods should be sought to reduce the direct contact between the coalition military forces and the Iraqi civilian population. Since this is a long-term association, it is better to set a pattern of peaceful coexistence such as removing some of the hardware, the intimidating hardware, and that can happen over time and slowly, so as to restore normal civilian life. In traditional tribal areas, much of the violence, I feel, is caused by a cultural misunderstanding of the conservative norms. I would put a special effort into friendly persuasion and cultural understanding and dialogue. The final point of my presentation touches upon what uh, my colleague said earlier, and that is there's been an undue emphasis on quotas and ethnic and uh, sectarian differences in Iraq. We all know that, and Saddam used those differences uh, effectively. And therefore, we, try, we should try to avoid that. Uh, most Iraqi families, I wish to emphasize, are ethnically and religiously mixed. There are millions of Sunnis who have never supported Saddam. They are the silent majority. And they he, meaning Mr. Hussein, I don't like to mention his name too much in here, he feared those Sunni leaders because they posed the most direct threat to his rule. Other than his immediate tribe, 90%, I would say, of the Sunnis were oppressed, like every other minority, I mean, every other sector in that country. And they did not support his regime. This group included, or happened to include, the middle class, the technocrats, the bureaucrats, and who have been the engine driving the country for years. So therefore, we need to be more inclusive of that group and open up a dialogue with them. At this juncture, I'll just add a few factoids that might shed a light on some of your questions, uh, Congressman Maloney. A law was promulgated and established in 1959 after the first Iraqi Republic, giving women equal rights, social and political rights with men. That law was promptly abolished by the Ba'athist regime. During that period, women enjoyed equal inheritance, equal, uh, they had rights in divorce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That law, as I said, they enjoyed it for three and a half years, 
after the Ba'athist regime, it was abolished. And of course, you can imagine what a, an uproar that created among the religious uh, clerics. But this was a secular government, the first Iraqi Republic. There was an unsuccessful attempt by the first Iraqi Republic to establish democracy. So a constitution, a secular permanent constitution was written, took a year to write it by the minds of the Justice Department at that time. Uh, it was finished after about a year by 63, but unfortunately, again, was abolished and unadapted when the coup, the Ba'athist coup came in. So that's out too. Uh, also, just something that everybody should know, uh, perhaps, and, or you are aware, that Iraqis have always had free access to education, medical care, and no, they have no income tax, although all of them do pay social security. In conclusion, I've tried to condense a lot of information with a historical pers perspective. However, uh, I've provided a bit more detail in my written testimony. I believe that Iraq has a good chance of being helped through its rebuilding process. I'm optimistic for the future because all the ingredients are now in place for success. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I apologize for missing um, the first uh, three speakers. I was on the floor managing a bill that came out of the committee as the chairman I had to uh, do that. Um, but we appreciate it very much. I'm going to start the questioning with Ms. Ms. Blackburn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to say thank you to each of you for taking your time to come and to talk with us and uh, be before us today looking at Iraq and the reconstruction efforts and, um, and you're moving forward and having a healthy, productive, viable country is so very, very important to us. And uh, Dr. al I uh, enjoyed your comments very much and appreciate those. And I have a constituent who is an Iraqi American physician. And he is uh, currently back in Iraq and working with um, the coalition partners in rebuilding the, the medical training facilities and the, um, the programs that will train nurses and, and doctors. And uh, some of the correspondence that I have had with him is that, you know, he, he says if anyone doubts that we have made an impression, they need to be here. And if anyone doubts that uh, Saddam Hussein had or used or exposed his people to chemical weapons, that they need to be here and see some of the children that are suffering from leukemia and other diseases. And I think he holds the position that many of us do that Saddam Hussein himself may have been the biggest weapon of mass destruction. And I, I would like for you to talk for just a, another brief moment, if you will, about the medical care delivery systems and uh, how quickly you see all of that coming back up to, back up to what you would consider to be par. Uh, <clears throat> please forgive me if I keep looking at the historical perspective because I think uh, there was much achieved in uh, Iraq in the 60s before pre-Saddam era. Uh, therefore, I don't know how bad it is right now, but I can tell you how good it was before Iraq was considered the most advanced Middle Eastern country in terms of medical care. It had the best medical schools, has the best doctors, had enough doctors and PhDs per capita. It was uh, then some of the Western countries had more per capita. Uh, of course, all of that, I imagine, uh, I have not Thank God I had not been uh, uh, seen the mess that he had created. Um, so I think the basis is there. Uh, the Iraqi people are highly sophisticated and educated. I just don't see those ones on the street. I just see some young rabble rousers, but the, most of the Iraqi people uh, are easier to work with than any other country in the Middle East. 
you have excellent uh, uh, cadre of people, of scientists, of uh, medical professionals, but they just haven't had um, the support that he, they should have had from Saddam. As far as the leukemias, I have heard that. I have not seen it, but I have heard that from our relatives, and it is frightening. I don't know what he was doing there. Nobody knows what he was doing there and what he did to the population. But we do know that there is an increased, of, uh, increased uh, frequency of susceptibility to leukemia and other malignancies that were not there, especially among children. Thank you, ma'am. I know I've certainly um, appreciated the, um, the work that this constituent has relayed that he is doing. As I said, he's Iraqi by birth, Iraqi trained physician, uh, left there in 91, came to the U.S., received his citizenship, has worked and lived and um, is in my district, has a wonderful family, and now he is back there to uh, help his people and to share the excitement that I know all of you share and have with the opportunities for freedom. And um, that leads to my next question. Ms. Gordon, I, um, I've been so intrigued with what I see as a, a fabulous opportunity for the Iraqi people as they move forward writing their constitution. And I appreciated your comments on that. And to me, it's a little bit miraculous to look at the fact that we're 160 days into this process. And it seems that, they're, that they are moving forward um, really rather quickly with a governing council in place, with the 25 heads of different ministries in place. And I thought I, I would like to see if you could speak for just a moment as to what you think that um, the time frame will be for completing a constitution and then moving that to ratification by the people and then moving from that to, um, to election of their, their officers. I, um, you know, do you think we're looking at a five-year period, a three-year period, or, or what would be your thought on that? In Japan, it took a year and a half. Uh, from the beginning to the end, but it, it, I think it was a very much easier task. So I have a feeling that in Iraq it will probably take longer. Okay. Dr. al I do you have some comment on that you'd like to share with me? I agree with her in the fact that, academically speaking, that's appropriate. But in reality, as I said, we have had maybe two constitutions. One was the monarchy constitution, and then it was redone, as I said earlier, by the first Iraqi Republic, and this was done by professionals, the Justice Department, Court of Appeals, all the judges. This was a functioning government with highly educated people, uh, and they did a, they wrote a secular constitution. Now that could serve as a base for uh, perhaps uh, the new constitution. I don't know where that constitution is. Uh, I'm sure there are some copies somewhere that the Ba'athists have hidden in, in Iraq, but that addressed a lot of the questions at that time, and it could be updated to the present, because it was highly secular, and it was uh, opposed by the clerics and the religious groups, so it must have contained something quite good for women, yeah. Thank you, Dr. al -Arif. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you very much. Ms. Maloney? Th thank, thank you so much. And I, I thank all of the panelists, and I, I want to publicly thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for uh, including uh, Mrs. Beate Gordon at my request to testify. It, uh, she has brought uh, important insights. And, and Dr. al -Arif, uh, your historical perspective is tremendously helpful, and I would really like to organize a meeting with the Women's Caucus for you to come and share your insights. I, I think it uh, would uh, really be very, very important. I, I can't uh, underscore, particularly after reading Mrs. Gordon's book, how important it is to get these rights in the Constitution, because even in America, you can't get rights into the Constitution. It's very hard. The document is in tremendously important. And I was very concerned about a news report, and I'm going to find that article and send it to you, about a Gallup poll that was taken in Iraq 
and I found it disturbing. It said that uh, uh, that the Iraqis didn't want the women to have as much uh, freedom as they'd had under Saddam Hussein. I mean, I found that hard to believe. Uh, but I, I'm very concerned about the Constitution because it would be a tremendous travesty if the women do not it, at the very least hold on to the rights that they had in the constitutions that were written in 63 and whatever you said, 58. And um, when I was there, I met many educated uh, uh, doctors, teachers, uh, women who were uh, very involved in, 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 uh, uh, in, in rebuilding their country and, and actually uh, very part of the, the fabric of it. So I, I just uh, um, want to know, do you think that there will be difficulty in drafting the Constitution? I understand there will be a number of women on the Constitutional Committee uh, getting these rights in the Constitution, the right to vote, the right uh, for medical care, the right uh, for education, uh, uh, the right for um, really uh, uh, the rights that really Mrs. Gordon outlined in her, her testimony. Do you think there will be any problem? Um. I don't, it, it's a little different, you know, we're, we're addressing uh, um, two different things. I'll, I'll, I'll explain myself in mm -hmm. one second, uh, very briefly. Uh, in Iraq, or in that culture, especially in Iraq, women have always had rights for, uh, guaranteed under whatever things, mm -hmm. but they were not all specifically equal. They had a right of inheritance. They had right of, like, a woman my age, I'm not young, but my mother, was a, which who is in her late 80s, was, was a teacher. Her classmates were doctors, judges. What country, show me, at, at 85 has these people? So they had that right, but they did not have social rights, such as the divorce. These have to do with religious sharia. So divorce, inheritance, we have one to two, one for women, two for men. It's guaranteed. You get an inheritance, but it's not equal. So therefore, I see only a problem if the religious clerics start, up, you know, start objecting to the fact that, oh, this is against this. And this. It has to be a completely secular social welfare for women. Uh, as far as rights are concerned, I, w I am appalled, to be honest with you, as to the condition of women under his regime, meaning, I don't want to mention his name continuously, uh, under the, re the uh, uh, old regime of Saddam Hussein versus the first Iraqi Republic, even the second Iraqi Republic. Uh, by the way, we're going to be on the fifth Iraqi Republic now. But uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, women had a lot more rights, and even in the 50s, we began to have these rights, only to be reversed by Saddam, by adopting this so-called phony religious overtone, which he never believed in anyway, but it served this political purpose. So he abolished that. I uh, have a few seconds left. In, in this book uh, by John Dower, Embracing Defeat, which uh, really goes through the Japanese experience in writing their constitution and building their country. And Ms. Gordon, you are treated very uh, positively in this book with your role with the constitution. But they talk about a peace clause that they placed in the constitution. And this was about the defense of the country. And I, I would like uh, Mrs. Gordon to respond to it. And also, Dr. Alareff, you were saying we need to employ and build the army. And you said to protect people, protect the streets, and, and this, so forth. And I'm all for that. But in our structure, that would be the police. The police protect the government buildings. The police protect the people. Why would you want the army instead of the police to have this function? Because the army sometimes has a vision of invading others or whatever. But Mrs. Gordon, could you briefly talk yes, about the uh, peace clause and its, its importance? Short paragraph, and it's chapter two of the Constitution of Japan. It's called Renunciation of War. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation, and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. 
In order to accomplish the aim and of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. It is true that the Japanese have built a defense force because it doesn't say here that you can't defend yourself. It doesn't specifically say you can defend yourself, but it doesn't say that you can't. And so they have built a defense force. However, in these 56 years since the Constitution has been active, no Japanese soldier has been sent outside of Japan. No Japanese soldier has killed another soldier. Neither has any Japanese soldier been killed. And not many countries can say that. Uh, Costa Rica has also a constitution in which an army is not permitted. They d don't have an aggressive army. They also don't have a defensive army. But uh, I think that is one of the great things about this constitution, that it may lead to peace if other countries in the world would also have such clauses that are against war. And the interesting thing about it is that it was the women in Japan <clears throat> who mostly supported this clause of peace. And they have kept on being behind it, even though the government right now, the Koizumi government, is trying to change the Constitution, especially this Article 9. They want to participate in peacekeeping forces for the UN, and uh, they, they want to be, quote, unquote, a normal nation. And it's very sad to think that the ability to make war is normal. So I don't know what will happen. But uh, in the meantime, it has, I think, 65% of the women have come out against any amendments to the Constitution, especially, of course, not to the renunciation of war. And uh, I think very few people know about this. I'm so glad uh, Representative Maloney asked about it, because very few uh, people in general in the United States know about this clause. And I think it's something to think about. Do you want me to address your question? Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. The reason I, uh, I have given in my uh, written testimony a brief history of the Iraqi army, it never belonged to Saddam. He did not organize the Iraqi army. The or Iraqi army was organized in 1921 by a British mandate. And it, it became the most highly respected and educated group of people that came in there. Um, its history is very rich. Um, I don't know what, what Saddam did to the army, but I don't think most of them, the rank and file, was not loyal to him. He had his own little... Uh, uh, but, my, but my specific question was, the, yeah, why, it, why the army and not the police force for protection of people, I'm et cetera, trying, which in our structure, as you know, the police protect our people, protect our buildings. I understand. The army uh, is defensive. Of, the army is the army. For, okay. you know. Well, because of the historical role that the army played versus the police. Police in Iraq, psychologically, the Iraqis don't like their police because they were always used uh, as spies, as uh, intelligent agents. They, they hurt. It's a, it's a psychological turnoff. Okay? So when they see a policeman, there's no respect. You know, I get no, they get no respect. But the, the army has always been on the side of the people. So they always like to see an army man. They trust them more. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hadari, can you tell us how we can get the Shias to help us uh, uh, with the old Ba'athist regime, turning these people in and uh, breaking their underground network? I think to fix the situation in Iraq. Can we get closer to the microphone? 
to fix the situation in Iraq, we need to talk about Iraqi total people, not one group. If we talk about one group, that will be very dangerous for us in the future in Iraq. As I said in my papers, the governing council, we need to extend it, to enhance it, put people who have mandate from their groups to make big influence. Now, let I give you one example, very simple example. In the Sunni Triangle, we have five members in the Iraqi Council, Sunni. Five members Sunni in the Iraq Council. Where is their rule in the Sunni Triangle? There is no rule. The role. There is no their role. We didn't find it. How to calm the area, how to convince the area to give good cooperation. I can't see anything. You can't see anything. We need people who make an influence in their groups. Correct. Not only Shi'i or only Sunni. Or, no, that's not enough. Absolutely. We have five Sunni now in the council. There is no influence in the Sunni area. We have 13 Shi'i. Some of them have some influence. But also there are a lot of Shi'i who have good influence outside the council. We need to have dialogue. These people are not against US. The people who are not in the council are not against US. No. But we need to open nice dialogue with them okay. to develop the council. About the army, excuse me, Shi'i and Kurdi and Kurd in general against the army. Because they believed army is Sunni organization. From 1921 until 1963, you can find high rank in the Iraqi army from Kurd, from Iraqi Turk, from Arabic Sunni. But it is very, very a few people, Shi'i, with high rank. From 1963 until 2003, the most of the high ranks in Iraqi military, the Iraqi army, are Arabic Sunni. So now, when we want to rebuild the Iraqi army, to help U.S., we need at least 300,000 Iraqi soldiers. Soldiers, all of them against Saddam Hussein. I will not say most. I say all of them. That means it is not right to disband this army. All the soldiers against Saddam Hussein. High ranks avoid them. But lower ranks, keep them to help us. Keep them to help us. In Iraq, there was school and high school, high college for officers and high officers. This school started in 1930s. So we need to depend also in the soil, in the uh, army, to fix the problem, not in Shia. Well, let me ask everybody, what can we do to try to get um, more Iraqis maybe to go back and help us with translations, intelligence gathering? We actually have a shortage of people that can do that kind of communication right now. Uh, you'd have to have proper screening. Is there anything that we could do, any signals we can send to American Iraqis that may want to help us in that? Or let me just start with Dr. Uh, al -Rif. Are you talking to me? Yes. Um, Congressman Davis, I'll just w say uh, sure. one comment on one thing sure. he said, because I basically agree with uh, uh, Mr. Haider. 
um, except one small, uh, I'll just correct you <laughs> once, and that is the uh, Abdel, General Abdel Karim Qasim was a Shi'i, by the yeah. way. Oh yeah, he was Shi'i. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get back to that. We basically are in agreement about the Iraqi army, and I did suggest earlier that we do use the lower ranking officers, so that's an agreement. How to galvanize the uh, Iraqi Americans, um, I would uh, probably, um, I mean, what, what you need are some soldiers basically on the ground going with, with the soldiers, translating, so you can't have PhDs doing that for you. So what you need is perhaps there are, uh, look at where are the uh, Iraqis uh, concentrated, maybe around the Detroit area, maybe around, um, you know, I don't know where, where they are, maybe Northern Virginia. Uh, put out some kind of a, a feeler uh, that we would like you to participate in this for X amount of time. And you may be surprised to get, you know, but they do have to go the screening mechanism and all that. But I'm sure between, in your district, for example, in Northern Virginia, there are a lot of Arabs and, and Iraqis, but mostly we need Iraqis. Yeah, one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the uh, governors of one of the provinces over there that was just elected had been in the PTA with me at Belvedere Elementary School. And he had gone back to Iraq and been elected governor in his uh, province. Ms. Maloney was there with me when we had a, had a reunion. So we're seeing some of that, but I think more of that would be helpful. And when we talk Absolutely. to military leaders, they thought that would be helpful as well. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I agree. a lot of people, of course, came here because of Saddam and the fact that it was yes. being oppressed and uh, you know, we could use their help. So we need to figure out a way to do our best recruitment on that. But I think that could help our cause. Absolutely. Um, Oh, Ms. Gordon, um, please. May I make a very yeah, short comment? Of course, on what please. Mr. Please. Haidari said, because in Japan, uh, I think General MacArthur had very much the same idea of using the Japanese in in various uh, uh, phases of the society, and what we had was a political purge. It was called. We also had an economic purge. It was a little bit like the denazification program in Germany. And uh, as you said, the higher ups in the army maybe should not be used, but the people lower down. That's exactly what we did in general. We had lists of who had been in what kind of militaristic group, who had been, you know, an ultra, ultra, ultra uh, conservative, etc. And the Japanese government provided that for us. And if anybody who was going to be now elected to the parliament or uh, be a high official in the army, whatever, they would have to be scrutinized according to that list that we, that we and the Japanese government together had formed. And so there were many people later on who got back into government or got into the army uh, who, you know, had not been on the correct side, but they were on a lower level. They did not have the power of the higher level, and it worked very well in Japan. Okay. Let me ask, um, it seems that the, uh, much of the Ba'ath Party, instead of fighting us in the North, took off their uniforms and went back into the population, and their strategy seems to be uh, to, uh, you know, become terrorists, uh, take out as many Americans or whoever else they can, get publicity, and hopefully America's will, uh, will dissipate. America will give up, go home, and they can come back into power. Uh, that's, that, it seems to me that's kind of what their strategy. They're not winning strategic victories by what they're doing, but they're hopeful that they can have an effect back here and discourage us from pulling out early, and then they have a shot to come back into uh, power. Um, what, what's your analysis? Uh, when I say that, is that a fair analysis? I'll start, Doctor. Yeah. Um, you know, the Baptists have had now two shots at, at, at Iraq, and they messed it up both times. This last time was a total disaster to the people. Right. Uh, after what the Iraqis have seen right now, and um, I, think, I think we're making too much of an issue of these people. I think they're just gonna die a natural death, you know? But what they're I, killing, the problem is that's where, that's where the, the, the disturbances are. If you I, didn't I, have that, it would be a much different situation. I understand, but uh, how do you, you know, if you look at Iraq's history, there had been several revolutions, 
And whenever there's a new revolution, and let's, let's assume this was like a revolution, but from the outside, uh, it takes time and there to purge the old regime. So la régime ancienne has to be gone. But you can't kill everybody. So eventually, once the leaders are gone, and for me, for all intents and purposes, right now, I see just discontented people who are without work and, and losing power. And there are not that many of them. They should be rounded up at some point and isolated. And uh, I think with the passage of time, I don't think they're really they're lethal. They're lethal to the person who gets killed. Yeah. But they're not that lethal. Uh, in terms of numbers, let's put it this way. Uh, during revolutions, as I said in the past, uh, there had been more yeah. killings. I understand. But from an American perspective, it's I lethal. Know. And if you remember what one sniper did to the I Washington know. area last year. I know. Uh, here you have literally a thousand snipers sitting around the remnants and, and uh, it's, uh, it has a, having a very chilly effect on Americans' perception of this war. And we have to take them out as quickly as we can. I, and, and, and we can't do it without cooperation from the Iraqi people. Well, I basically stated here how you can right. get uh, the cooperation of the Iraqis by including them all, right. by getting uh, a cultural understanding. They come around. They really do come around. I think um, they are so tired of those wars and, and, and Saddam and his problems and and they need to live a normal life. So I think by, inc by inclusiveness and making life more normal for the civilian population, you, you, you may be seeing it now, I think. I, I don't know, I haven't been to, uh, to Iraq, but I think you're seeing it a lot, things are a lot better now than they were before, aren't they? Yeah. Right? So, uh, perhaps. Okay, Mr. Jari. I believe there are two ways to eliminate Saddam party. First, we need to open office for investigation. We will not know Saddam people, some Saddam law, lawyer, followers, about 10,000, let me suppose them, not more, by our detective. We need to depend on Iraqi people to know them. How? By investigation, let Iraqi people come to these ki this kind of office and give us their names, give us their history, and then we can find them or Iraqi people will help us to arrest them. This is one way. Another way, we want to build good relationship with Iraqi people. Iraqi people should be our eyes in all areas. If we can build good relationship, we can eliminate Saddam and his party. Sorry to say that. Until now, we didn't build that well. I give you the best example. Shia suffered from Saddam a lot. Massacre, the best example. And until now, they don't help us well. They are watching the situation. They are watching the situation. We need to deal with them, to attract them to our side. If we do that, we eliminate Ba'ath. Ba'ath is not a problem. Ba'ath is a small group. I know them. I don't read about them in book. I know them. Ba'ath is not dangerous. No. We can eliminate them very easily. But we need to depend on Iraqi people. When, how, this is the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Janklow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Ms. Gordon, if I could ask you, ma'am, when, when did the occupation by the Allies end in Japan? Do you remember? When did it? When did the occupation by the Allies yeah. end in Japan? It's, as you know, it started in 45 and it ended in 52. And so it was really 1952, yes. it was really seven years after the second right. after the surrender of right. the Japanese regime that finally our uh, uh, our soldiers left Japan as an occupying force. Right. And it was also I lived in Germany in 1948, 49, and 50, and my father was part of the army of occupation right. of Germany. And the only point I'm making is we become pretty frustrated in America 
that we haven't solved all these problems in six months uh, after the invasion of Iraq, when in reality, it takes a while to write a constitution, assemble a provisional government, uh, unless we're going to write it for them. I mean, we can write a constitution for people, but if they're going to write a constitution, it takes a while. Then they have to go through a process of debate. It isn't like ours gets changed very often after an awful lot of debate and discussion. And then, um, and then they get around to elections. I, so the point I was trying to make is these things take time. Iraq wasn't just waiting there to throw off the yoke and rise up and do all of these functions. The, you know, as I understand it, Mr. Hadari, let me ask you. As I read your resume, you were a member of the Ba'athist Party. As a matter of fact, you were a, uh, you were a regional, uh, co you, part of the regional command wing at one time. Um, so when you speak about the Ba'ath Party, you obviously speak from very personal knowledge. Am I correct? Yes. And when did you decide you weren't a member of the Ba'ath Party? That you no longer believed in their ideals or goals? Excuse me, while you're thinking, sir, go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Miss Olaya, you're... Huh? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you have a response to that? I, I, I have never been a member of the No, no, I, I was talking to Mr. Hadari, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. No, sorry. I was a friend for Ba'ath as a friend in 19, you can say, 58. Exactly. Uh, I but, see... Okay, excuse me, go ahead. But... In 1959-56, we have another group split from Ba'ath. It says on your resume, in 1962, yes. I became a member yes. of the regional yes. command wing yes. 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 of the Ba'ath yeah. Party. In 1959, we left Ba'ath. And as a member, original member. Sure. But raised in the, this group very quickly. In 1962, I was in the top of the responsibility of a new group. If, if I could ask you two gentlemen, and also the lady, the three of you from Iraq Heritage, are we doing anything right in Iraq? Is our country doing anything right? In your opinion? Yes, ma'am. Yes, many things right. Could you elaborate a little, please? First of all, um, as I said earlier, the fact that Iraq is actually, for the first time in its life now in uh, They've been trying since uh, 50 years now to be free. Uh, they are free. The Iraqis are free. And as I said earlier, I'm a testament when I'm talking. I've never done this in my entire life. I've been in the state since 57. I've never done this. I would have my family shot. Secondly, um, Iraq longs, have longed to be a modern Iraq. It is the cradle of civilization, but it has remained in the dark ages. It has not come into the industrial age. It has longed to belong to the 21st century. But and they are, America is bringing it to the 21st century. Okay. Mr. Hadar? The most important thing we did in Iraq, we liberate Iraq from Saddam Hussein. Are we doing anything else? We, we, this is the most important thing. How can we invest this truth? Have, have you... We have good balance in Iraq. If I can personalize this just for a moment, sir. What, have you gone back to Iraq since the war has been over? Yes, I went in uh, Ju July, Ju June. I stayed there three nights, four nights, and came back. Do you, do you consult with our government on what they should be doing? Uh, you, you, I have uh, a long talk with uh, our government people, a long. 
I talk with them about many things. Not now. I can't say for I have been talking for two years. How long do you think it should take to write a new constitution for, for Iraq? If, if we start a new constitution, mm -hmm. first, how we will we do the constitution? First, not only constitution. Now I think we are not in correct way to put this constitution. We appoint people for that. And Iraqi people are not support this direction. Some of them support, others don't support. And, and sir, I know, and my time's up, but I notice from your testimony that you do say that the Iraqi people don't support the provisional council that's been appointed. How should we select one, and how long should it take to select the appropriate council to help draft the constitution for Iraq? I, I understand you for suggest me, who should be, who should I, be included, we, but how should they be selected, and how long should that take? We doesn't need more than six months, I believe. Six months, enough to make everything stability in Iraq, stable in Iraq. Six months, not more. We, if we extend this council, we can extend the council. I don't want to say to cancel it, extend it, enhance it. We can choose a lot of people to make this council stronger, make good influence in Iraqi people. We expand the council. In other words, the basic council is okay, it needs to be enlarged. No, I, I will not say okay. I say some of the Miran bugs are okay. Some of them are not okay. From point of view of Iraqi people. Some of them are okay. Some of them are not okay. As I told you at the beginning, isn't, there are five isn't that the way democracy works? Some are okay, some are not okay. No, excuse me, when you want to choose especially in these days. The people choose this guy or that guy, they are free to do what they want. But we want to appoint some people to help us in our plan in Iraq. I think we have to look for the good people who can help us really and be a good influence in Iraqi people. So now we need to extend, I think. It is necessary to extend this concept. Can I ask one more question, Mr. Chairman, briefly? I, all, of you, all of you emphasize that we must do something about the former police and the former military. And clearly, the history in most countries, be it Japan or Germany um, or Panama, it doesn't make any difference. There's a long history of bringing the protecting forces back into play after some of the leadership and the troublemakers are eliminated uh, or removed from uh, possibility, I don't mean eliminated in the physical sense, removed from the possibility of being involved in control. My question is, the, the gentleman, the former police commissioner from New York, testified today that they've got 40,000 policemen back employed uh, in Iraq. Um, is that a good start? We need in Iraq, between policemen and soldiers, at least 300,000. You, you need 300,000 for least, a nation of 26 million? Yeah, excuse me. We need them to help uh, our administration there and, our, and Iraqi people to reach the peace inside Iraq. If we depend, because I prefer, in my opinion, and I testify, I prefer if we let our army be outside of the Iraqi cities. We don't want to see our army to have any conflict with Iraqi people. We have army in Iraq, not policemen. So we want to depend on Iraqi police, not American soldiers. 
that's much better to us. Also, it is much better to us than asking Turkey, and we have some differences now in Iraq, because ask about Turkey army to come in Iraq. Let us depend on Iraqi army. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Alaraf, yes. you say you don't, that the Iraqi people don't like the police, so have the army do it. Yeah. He says they don't like the army, have the police no. do it. What should no, we no, no, no. I don't think he said. Did you? No, he didn't say that. His English, I think. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He said the army should not be in the cities. It should no, be no. Uh, American army. American oh, army. I apologize. Is, I yes. thought you American meant the American army, army should yes. not be yes. in the city. We are in agreement also, about Also, we don't need to, to invite to Turkey army to come to Iraq. We want to depend on Iraqi army. Right. I think we and all. That's very cheap. We agree with that. Thank you. I, I think that. we agree with that. Thank. Thank you very much. This has been very, very helpful uh, to the committee as we move forward. I want to ask unanimous consent to put into the record a letter from Gary Sinise. He is a Tony and Emmy Award winner and Academy Award nominee uh, that he wrote the committee. Um, and also an article uh, from Vanity Fair by, uh, what's the first name? Mr. Hitchens. Uh, on these uh, situations that, that I think will be helpful for the, for, for the record and uh, without objection, these will be put into the record. Um, any other questions from committee members? Let, let me thank this panel. It's been very helpful to us uh, as well in our deliberations and we appreciate you staying with us uh, through the afternoon and being here to answer our questions and your testimony, your total testimony is going to be made part of the record. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, meetings adjourned.
For more information on Iraq, go to our website, cspan.org. You'll find archived programs on Iraq and links to other related sites. President Bush is speaking tonight at the Republican National Committee Presidential Gala. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2 at 7.10 p.m. Eastern. 